Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am talking with Ashley Ward. Ashley is a biologist and professor of animal behavior at the University of Sydney, where much of his research focuses on many social behaviors of animals, including krill, fish, birds, and many mammals. He is the author of the book, The Social Lives of Animals, How Cooperation Conquered the Natural World. And that is what we discuss in this conversation. We start the conversation off by talking about krill and how they cooperate and why they're so important. Uh, Krill are super important uh, creatures of the sea that are really, you know, spurring on the whole ecosystem and many, many oceans and for many other uh, animals and they're super essential. And there's many things we're still learning about uh, krill. We talk about locusts and their exchange of serotonin. We talk about the social lives of roaches. Um, We talk about inclusive fitness with bees, um, along with the curious systems of bee colonies. We talk about ant colonies and many of the ways in which they have different ways of handling conflict. We talk about the social connection of birds, adaptive flexibility and reciprocity of rats, animal domestication and the ethics of farmed animals, social hierarchy of elephants, lions and hyenas, uh, how primates use deception, and how all of these animals help inform uh, many of the things that make us who we are as humans. Um, his book and the conversation really is a kind of a world tour through the animal kingdom, talking about many different animals and the the running thread throughout the, the the book and the conversation is what does cooperation look like in many 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 animals throughout the animal kingdom, um, and what are some of the things we can learn about cooperation in ourselves? Obviously, I've talked about cooperation. A um, handful of times on the podcast, and I really value and appreciate Ashley's uh, perspective here because he's looking at many, many different uh, animals and saying, "Hey, how do they how do they cooperate for them?" And again, how can we how, how can we learn from other animals uh, on our planet? So now I bring you Ashley Ward. I am here with Ashley Ward. Ashley, uh, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm super excited to uh, to talk to you and talk to you about your wonderful book. So uh, thanks for coming on. Likewise, thanks for the invite. Yeah, yeah. So you are you are down down under in, uh, in Australia, and uh, and I am not, and so we have quite the time difference here, uh, which is kind of cool. And um, I want to I want to talk to you about your book, but before we do, why don't you tell listeners who you are? Um, what your background is, what you do, kind of give us your uh, quick summary of, of yourself and uh, how you came to write the book. A, a, a very brief sort of summary involves me growing up in the north of the UK and being fascinated by animals, but never really having the confidence to follow that through, never thinking that a uh, university education was for the likes of me. Um, that path was changed largely due to serendipity rather than due to any kind of uh, uh, kind of relentless ambition or goal on my part. But eventually I did go to university. I did study biology and I took to it. I loved it. I, I loved the science of it. I loved finding out about animals, but more, more than that, finding out about animals in the context of science. Um, that led to um, a PhD with a wonderful supervisor, uh, Jens Krauser. And eventually to a job offer from Australia, a place I'd never been or even much thought of. And I've been there now for 15 years. Wow. But I've resisted picking up the accent. Not deliberately, but um, it just hasn't happened. So you start to cope with my uh, Northern English accent. <laughs> no, it's, it's perfectly, perfectly uh, all well and good. How did you come uh, to uh, to write the book that you've uh, just uh, just put out uh, or, or putting out? Uh, how, how did you come along to write the book? Well, when you obviously when you work in research, you end up finding out more and more about less and less, as it's sometimes said. You you go along the branches of knowledge until you get to some fairly fine twigs, and that's fascinating as a researcher. 
But sometimes in your career, you want to stop and take stock of, um, of where your research question sits in the broader field. And so this led to me writing a book with a colleague of mine, Mike Webster. Uh, this was a science book, which we put out, um, or an academic book, really, uh, that we put out in 2016. And in discussions with the publisher, it kind of astonished me when they told me that they were going to do an, in an, an initial print run of 1,000. Now, this is a project which had taken me a year and a half of really hard effort. And my goal had been to try and reach a bigger audience. But when they told me it was going to be a print run of a thousand, I thought, oh, that feels like obviously like a very, very close to a waste of time. <laughs> I, thought, I thought, why don't I try and write a book that's similar to that, but to reach a broader audience rather than just to this relatively small um, community of scientists. I want to reach the public and try to infuse them in the way that I'm infused um, by the animals. And so really that, that's where the idea started. Of course, the actual book that I've put out that's, that's out now is, it bears very little relation to the academic book. Um, it's really more, um, it, it, my, my enthusiasm for the animals is brought to the fore. Uh, the science is still there, but it's not purely a book for academics, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it, you know, I think it does a really good job of communicating science, which is what we always need, and trying to, uh, you know, yes, be informative about different types of animals within the, you know, within the natural world, but also trying to find what's the through line. And so for you, um, it's uh, cooperation. So the book is called The Social Lives of Animals, How Cooperation Conquered the Natural World. Uh, and the way I kind of saw it was, it was it's a very, um, very good read. It's a, a way of kind of uh, the book, I don't know if it's intentional, but I kind of saw it as, you know, first, you know, four to five chapters are kind of how cooperation works with animals um, that are non-mammal. And then the second half of the book um, seems to mostly deal with other uh, uh, animals that are mammals, such as uh, you know, orcas and rats and humans and apes. And so it's, it's very much you kind of start very small and then kind of get bigger and things are, I guess, closer to us as humans. Um, so I guess the, 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 the first place that we can, we can start is kind of at the beginning. Um, something that I've, you know, learned about more recently is the importance of krill. So maybe for listeners that don't know uh, what krill are, uh, just tell us what these uh, creatures are, who, what they are, and, and why they're so important for uh, really the ecosystem for much of the Southern Ocean and, and many oceans, but definitely the Southern Ocean. Yeah, the krill are a, a remarkable animal that they're perhaps the only single species or animal that outweighs, um, that outweighs humans. Um, you know, you might say, well, okay, ants outweigh us, worms outweigh us, but this one single species, Antarctic krill, um, is so numerous that, that collectively they, they outweigh us. Mm. That in itself, of course, doesn't necessarily make them interesting, but when, if people have heard of Antarctic krill, perhaps the only thing they've been exposed to is the sight of krill disappearing down a whale's neck. Mm -hmm. That that's really the only only part that they seem to play in any kind of a documentary is the fall guys these uh, floating little morsels of food. So, what are they? They're about the length of your finger. Um, they are Antarctic specialists. They, when I finally got to see them at the uh, Australian Antarctic Division down in Hobart, Tasmania, one of the things that really struck me was just how different their whole um, their whole world is. They they move in this incredibly slow way. Um, they, they can speed up, but generally speaking, in this slow motion way because of the water that they live in. Um, they, they look like animals, as indeed they are, that are from an utterly different place. And yet they're so successful. They've pretty much come to dominate that place. And ultimately they're responsible for that entire ecosystem, which means that they are the basic food stuff for the fish, the birds, the seals, the whales, all of those charismatic megafauna that live in the Antarctic or near the Antarctic, or indeed even migrate to the Antarctic. 
are there only because the krill are there. Now, the krill themselves, of course, feed on algae and things like that that, that, that float around in the water. But as a part of that process of, of doing that, they uh, munch up huge amounts of CO2 and then excrete it so it falls to the bottom of the ocean where it gets pretty much locked away for centuries. So they're sequestering CO2 um, at an enormous rate and so potentially, at least, we hope, delaying the effects of um, accelerated CO2 in the environment. And how, how do they, so they have essentially two major, well, two major purposes for how we understand it in terms of the, the system down there, which is, you know, they're basically the, 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 the lunch and dinner for many animals in the, in the, uh, in the ocean down there. So for, for whales and seals and many, many animals in the, in the ocean. And then also, as you just, uh, expressed, you know, for CO2 to, to push it down, which is, which is, you know, we should all be grateful for, but I guess the two questions are there is, you know, how do, what are other, um, I guess, you know, I don't want to say uses, but what are their other, I guess, functions within that ecosystem and how do they contribute in terms of how we understand how they're social or how they cooperate at least, um, you, know, you know, together? Yeah, well, I think one of the most dramatic things about krill is, is their sheer numerosity. So they're one of the few animals, again, that you can see from space. Um, they form these colossal um, aggregations that we call swarms. And really where my research came to touch upon them was just trying to find out what it was about these swarms. Were these swarms just the uh, result of um, ocean currents that uh, push them together and hold them in you know, kind of eddies in the, in, in the sea, or, or are they actually socially attracted? And what we found, found was that they really are socially attracted to one another. They, they do intentionally come forward uh, come forward to, to, to form these, these groups. So the groups themselves must be of, of some importance to them. And it turns out that, yes, indeed, they are. There are so many of them out there that they actually change the currents of the, of the ocean that they're in. So I guess that's one, one big picture thing. Mm. The sheer number of these animals all pushing water downwards continuously means that you get these really ocean scale circulating systems that result from the krill swimming behavior. But the other part of that for the krill is that, you know, every, obviously um, every action has an equal, equal and opposite reaction. They are buoyed by the returning currents from their own swimming, if you like. So living in, living in a swarm like that helps to um, maintain them, maintain uh, them near the surface when they, when they need to be there. Um, with a minimum of effort. I guess where they're important to humans is increasingly there's pressure to try and fish them. Mm. So there are things like krill oil, um, which has been uh, suggested as, a, as an alternative to various fish oils because krill are so numerous. Um, but that, of course, raises the risk that factory ships will go down there, hoover the animals out of the sea, and really just decimate the population. There are two things that act against that, one of which is <clears throat> to do with the climate down there and the weather down there, and particularly the seas. They, these are some of the roughest seas in the world, which makes it very difficult to work with. But the other thing that makes krill difficult to catch is that they are, we now know, packed with these incredibly powerful enzymes, enzymes which are optimized to work under these extreme temperatures. And these, these enzymes themselves, when the krill are caught, if the krill are at all damaged, the krill basically autolyze, they, they, they dissolve in their own, in, in their own um, enzymes, which is kind of weird. But the other part of that is that these enzymes, now that we know about them, have enormous potential for medical science, for wound cleaning and things like that. So, it's so often the case that we get these animals, which few people think about, um, that render up all kinds of fantastic things that, that we humans can potentially benefit from if we just do a little research and find out a bit more about them. So I guess that's, that's the big picture with the krill. These really unheralded creatures um, have lots and lots of potential and, and potentially um, 
there are areas you know that uh, that they still offer us things that, that that we need to find out more about um i mean it seems incredible to me that if you were to make a list of the 10 most important in the ecological terms animals on the planet antarctic krill would be in there yeah simply because they single-handedly support an entire ecosystem mm -hmm. and yet almost nothing about them mm -hmm. so this, this finding about these enzymes is relatively new um, our own research on how krill swarms are formed and are maintained had not been done before, which, you know, again, seems remarkable. There's much, much more to find out. And that's the exciting thing about science, I think, you know. Um, sometimes we get this idea that we've found out everything that's worth finding out, but it's so far from the truth. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I, I remember, you know, when I first found out about this, you know, a couple of years ago, I didn't know what krill were. I was like, oh, okay, well, that's cool, I guess. But then when you recognize how essential they are to entire ecosystems, and, and literally meaning that, like, other animals will die if they don't. I mean, large animals uh -huh. will die if they don't have access to krill. And not to mention how they're able to push down CO2. I mean, they're, they're, they're super essential. I mean, for, for that whole area and for that whole system. And, and just as you said, there's so many things. We, 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 there's, there's so many question marks, so many unknowns, so many mysteries um, for such an essential uh, player in, in the uh, in the region down there is 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 just is absolutely remarkable. So it's they're they're, you know, they're fun to read about, and I can imagine for for you, it's fun to study, and all these, you know, there's always something new to find out, which is you know kind of makes that really really cool. So absolutely, I mean, they, they just as a a quick extra to that is is that the sister species of Antarctic krill, Pacific krill, um, off the west coast of the U.S. Um, some little while ago, there was a, an algal bloom of the non-food species of algae um, for this particular krill. And the krill population just collapsed mm. uh, this one year. And the impact of that, despite Pacific, Pacific krill are important, but they don't have the same kind of reach as the Southern Ocean Antarctic krill. Mm -hmm. The impact of that was enormous on the um, all kinds of mammals. Apparently, there were whales washed up emaciated you know there's a, a huge knock-on effect of this one-year population crash for the pacific crew. and hopefully obviously nothing like that will happen in the antarctic but it is something to um that we need to be conscious of the fact that um at the moment the krill fishing industry is regulated mm -hmm. Of course, operating in conditions like that, we simply don't know how many krill there are. There are we have estimates uh, done by wonderful experts around the world, but because it's so difficult to study in the, in the Southern Ocean, there are large um, there's, there's a large standard error associated with any of those estimates. Sure. And it's important to try and find out a little more about this animal before we rush in and try and hoover them all out of the ocean. <clears throat> yeah, no, I firmly agree, and it just calls more for the the need for uh, conservation and preservation, and which many groups and foundations are doing, and and that's you yeah. know we need to prop that work up. So it's, it's fantastic. Uh, so now I talk to you about uh, I, I want to get to bees because obviously many people will think about you know you know the colonies and cooperation. Before we do that, we'll just talk about some other uh, small critters. Um, so you mentioned in the book. Uh, grasshoppers, locusts, cockroaches. Um, these are usually the, the, the most favorite insects for all humans. We Everyone loves these guys, right? <laughs> um, Absolutely. <laughs> um, so I, I guess, you know, there's, you know, again, in, in the book, you, you mentioned different things about them. But I guess the kind of general question I have is, is that it seems to be that for these these three that they do operate in large numbers and that there is some element of a cooperative way of functioning of how to have their own individuality specifically with the roaches but they still live in groups um and then there's these two phases of locusts so just just tell us about with in with these insects in particular how do we understand them to be cooperative what what can we say i guess about why they may do that and um and how and how they're traveling in such these uh, large numbers 
Yeah, I think, uh, well, if we go in order of cooperation from, from least to most in those animals that you've mentioned, and we start with locusts. Locusts uh, are, I guess, somewhat similar to Antarctic krill, um, particularly for people living in the urbanized Western world that, you know, have, have heard of these animals, but no, probably not really encountered them. Mm -hmm. For people living in huge swathes of, of particularly Africa, um, parts of the Middle East, and indeed there are other species that go throughout Asia, and even Australia. So a few years ago, there was an outbreak of the Australian um, locust, which where the swarm was the size of Spain. Oh, uh, goodness. Ridiculous. Oh, my goodness. So these animals aren't necessarily cooperative in any, in, in any sense that we, we might uh, understand the world. So they are shy, solitary creatures for most of the time. They operate using camouflage. They avoid their neighbors if possible. And they hang around on plants and munch away and live a very quiet life, avoiding social situations. Periodically, what happens is that you get um, a rainy, the rainy season arrives, and that gives rise to um, a huge uh, blossoming of all the vegetation in the environment. And then the locusts really get to work laying lots and lots of eggs. The population booms. The locusts uh, really start to tackle the vegetation. But what happens then is that their capacity for eating outstrips the vegetation's ability to, uh, to grow. And so you get these ever shrinking little islands of vegetation with huge numbers of locusts. And these islands contract further and further and, uh, to the point where these um, antisocial animals start to bump into each other. Once that happens, they start rubbing up against each other. So when I say bump into each other, I mean that literally. They kind of jostle at the, at the, uh, at the food trough, if you like. And that starts to trigger this one of the most amazing transformations in any of the animal kingdom whereby the animal where the, the locusts go from what we call the solitarious phase to the gregarious phase mm. and at this point they just about everything about the locust changes their appearance changes their behavior changes their internal physiology changes and they stop being isolates they stop being uh what we call in in the uk billy nomades they start to join these huge groups um, and they start to move as one. And that for the people who live in the areas um, associated with the desert locusts can be absolutely horrendous because the locusts move in colossal numbers um, and can just devastate huge amounts of farmland for people who are already potentially uh, struggling somewhat. I believe you say in the book that there's an increase in serotonin and that's in the body and that's what is in, impacting the yes. changes. Is this correct? It, 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 tell right. us, tell yeah. us about that. Yeah, so this, when the animals start to bump into each other, uh, it was actually a colleague of mine that, that, that first dis really discovered this and got to the bottom of this. But what it is, it's, the, it's when the hind legs of these animals rub together and over a, a, a relatively short period of time, this produces a, a physiological cascade in the animals. And um, their body starts to produce serotonin, which has the ultimate effect of, of making them more precarious. <clears throat> um, and it does similar things uh, in, in us as well. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Called it the party hormone. Um, so <clears throat> it's this really that, that, that sets in train this, this massive transformation in the whole in the animal's appearance outlook and, and everything um at which point they, they start to be behave in these or start to um move in these enormous um armies if you like um absolutely everything in sight they, they're pretty much unstoppable um so once these locust armies are, are sort of on the move there's very little we can do to stop them but we have fair, some fairly ineffectual measures such as taking up helicopters and spraying them with insecticide, but really it's, you know, it's, it's pissing into the wind, to be honest. Um, some people, you know, farmers in desperation might set fire to a, 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 strip of, a strip of land to try and encourage them to go elsewhere, but really the, it's, a, it's an insatiable and unstoppable eating machine. 
So again, here's another animal that we, we've really only begun to research in these contexts relatively recently. And if we can unpick things like this serotonin uh, mechanism, we can perhaps understand and get to the bottom of what it is that makes them gregarious in the first place and hopefully find some kind of switch that just keeps them in that sort of nice grasshoppery of avoiding stage where they cause very little damage. Mm. Um, so that would be an immediate benefit from, from that kind of research. And, and and so t tell us about the the, the roaches because you know most people, you know I mean have a huge aversion to to cockroaches and and again there's so many different types and they're bigger and they fly in different places and you know we have the ones here in the states that are kind of you know small and you know there's all these different types but most people don't like roaches um, and <laughs> and so when you're in the book you talk about um, some of their functioning as individuals but them being in groups and how they, how they manifest, but just tell us what it is about them that's so unique uh, and how, what they contribute to this idea of, you know, how they, how they cooperate. Well, Xavier, I, I noticed that when you said, uh, you said the word small to, to refer to a cockroach there, you, you actually, you actually indicated something which for me would be horribly large. I mean, the size of a, I don't know, some <laughs> chocolate biscuit or something. It was, uh, yeah. No, look, I, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to be an advocate for cockroaches, I'm afraid. I, I, the first time I, I saw, um, I, I don't know what you guys call them in America, but um, over here they're called American cockroaches. I don't know if that's fair or unfair, but um, these are horrible animals. I mean, these are, I guess, like the krill, if we're going to use the, uh, the, the metric scale of, of, of hand size, these, are, these can get up to about the length of your finger, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and they are vectors of disease. They're fairly disgusting. Well, I, I say fairly. They're very disgusting. Mm -hmm. And even biologists, I, I just can't bring myself to, uh, to, to like these creatures. Um, mm -hmm. and I, have, I, I sort of gave myself a bit of a talking to when my visceral reaction to them was just one of, of utter horror. Mm -hmm. It seems, you know, I ought to at least know a little bit about these animals before before I judge them. But no, it, it was visceral. I couldn't get past it. They they are unwelcome visitors to to any household. Mm -hmm. Um. So when we see them, we see them on their own. So it can come as a surprise to lots of people that these are social animals. But unlike many social animals, what tends to happen is that they have a single central area where they tend to congregate. And then particularly of an evening, they'll um, disband from that and go their own separate ways to forage individually. But ultimately they will go back to this, to this shelter where they'll hang out with other cockroaches, I guess potentially swapping news on, on a good food source or what have you. But one of the mo most important functions of this is to, um, obviously the, there's, in, it's important in terms of reproduction, but also in terms of avoiding desiccation. Um, but really, it comes down to you know finding out where where resources are, and the cockroaches seem to get considerable benefits from this. They are incredibly simple animals, and yet they do seem to function better when they group than when they don't. Um, to the point that if you isolate a cockroach and prevent it from uh, interacting with other cockroaches during its development, something goes fundamentally wrong and that cockroach can no longer behave as a cockroach ought. It, it simply hmm. becomes a weak and uh, rather pathetic version of, of what it otherwise would have been. So there's some element of sociality which, which seems to buoy these animals um, to a quite dramatic degree. And this is one of the, the simplest animals in which you, you see this phenomenon which potentially we'll, we'll talk about later when we talk about mammals but it seems to be some kind of social buffering which is which generally refers to the support that animals get from hanging out with others of their own kind and which of course is important only for, for cockroaches but like i say for other mammals and very very much including us yeah, it's 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 a, it's a again. I remember reading the book and and also feeling the same way, of like oh, God, I don't want to read about roaches. It's just, <laughs> oh man, I don't know. I don't know how much I can do that. Um, but you know, it it is 
it is it is you know it's a it's an, it's, an, it's part of the animal kingdom and natural world and they they do have their sources of uh functionality and and uh it's important to understand them um i do want to ask about the the bees which i referenced earlier um many people will make a uh, a big to do about the bee colonies right and how they how they operate and how you know i think there's some understanding that they are social but you know what what is it in particular of how they work together right how do they incorporate inclusive fitness how do they deal with conflict just kind of tell us some of the things from you know your research about what you understand about you know bees and the colonies how they cooperate um and, and some of these other things like inclusive fitness and, and conflict sure so before I get straight to bees, uh, I should say probably that what we're talking about here generally is perhaps the most incredible example of sociality that has yet evolved, which is um, that displayed by social insects. Hmm. So social insects includes animals, including bees, but also wasps, ants, and um, termites. Now, termites, it comes as, as a surprise to many people to learn, are essentially cockroaches. Um, they're very, very closely related. Mm -hmm. All of these social insects have in common is that they um, have not only the nest that you described, but also this um, caste system, whereby you'll get some animals who are workers, some animals who are potentially soldiers, and you'll get certain reproductives. And what usually happens is that there, there is one reproductive queen who, who gives birth to all the eggs. And those eggs are looked after by, by workers. And what this generates is a system whereby all the animals in a given colony of social insects are very, very closely related. Mm -hmm. The idea behind that is that, or I guess the evolutionary explanation for that is that because they're so closely related, um, each individual is, in inverted commas, happy to give up its own reproductive rights because it's raising its own brothers or sisters. Um, and so this fundamental drive that most animals have to produce copies of themselves, to reproduce, is not necessarily uh, so strongly felt among social insects. So that's the idea of inclusive fitness, that you can get fitness in the biological sense from having your own offspring, but you can also get fitness from raising uh, your very close relatives. So that's inclusive fitness. And this is, I guess, the glue that binds these social insect colonies together, this genetic linkage between all the animals in the colony. And this, in theory at least, means that their colonies are harmonious places where they're all working towards a, a, a goal, even though in most cases, none of them will have any idea what that goal is. Mm. They're all working in harmony. Mm. Um, but recent research suggests that isn't necessarily the case, that as in any society, there is a degree of tension once you dig below the surface, which is just fascinating. Uh, yeah, well, I think that's, that's, a, that's another thing. It's a, it's a good uh, kind of preamble here for this, is that I think many people when they look at, let's say, humans, right? And they'll say, oh, we'll talk about things like social cognition, right? Or how we work together and, or, you know, interdependence. And, you know, as you scale up in the, in the, you know, quote unquote animal hierarchy, you know, we have larger brains and we have abstraction. And so I think most people kind of see or may think of uh, cooperation or sociality as a cognitive thing or is very centered on the brain. But, I mean, we're talking about insects that have, <laughs> they don't think they have a central nervous system in some, for, in some cases, you know, or, or if they do, it's very, very small. You know, they don't obviously have, you know, brains in the same way that, you know, mammals do. You know, we're talking about, you know, impulses, if you will, right? And there is a type of genetic link, I guess you could say, but what is it that is... I guess, fueling that, right? It, it would have to be something like inclusive fitness, or as you're saying, there's a type of a caste system or a system of where there's these roles distributed. But, you know, I think most people w will, will wonder, well, how is that possible, right? If they have very small brains or they have no brains or, <laughs> or you know, whatever, you know, how is that possible that they're able to, to be so social and to, to cooperate? Yeah, I think 
you know, sometimes we, we view things from a human perspective, as you say, and, you know, we tend to emphasize the intellectual aspects of sociality. But for these insects, they're following relatively simple rules of thumb that have been, that have really stood the test of, of time. So, yeah, when we talk about um, sociality and things like social cognition from a human perspective, we tend to emphasize the intellectual aspects of that. Um, you know, we tend to think about sociality uh, rather than as something which is um, instinctive to us, as something which is, um, that has to be linked to emotions, to, to, to cognition, to uh, deep thought. Whereas for these insects, of course, as you suggest, this, this really isn't part of their world so much. What these insects are doing, these social insects, is to, they, they, they apply simple heuristics, simple rules of thumb, which have stood the test of time over millions of years and which make them incredibly spellbindingly successful mm -hmm. by simply following the, the, these, these rules of thumb. So if you think about termites building a mound, you know, if, if you see termite, a, a termite mound in, in Africa, it's, it's an extraordinary feat of engineering built by animals who haven't the faintest idea what they're building. They're, they're following a simple rule of thumb, which is essentially that each worker goes out, gets a little wet ball of mud in its mouth, takes it back to the building and puts it next to another wet ball of mud and then goes back and repeats it ad infinitum to the point where eventually they create these staggering mounds. I mean, it's one of the most incredible phenomena in the world that you could get animals building something which has the complexity of a termite mound, which is, you know, ventilation. It has... Um, it has different chambers. It has all sorts of facets to it. And yet not a single termite could even begin to conceive of what that looks like as a whole. Mm -hmm. and so, yeah, it's, it's sometimes being suggested that social insects have a kind of a collective intelligence, a, a, mm -hmm. a intelligence. So it's been likened to, you know, if you take a single neuron from a human brain, that neuron is capable of almost nothing. But in... Um, a mass of neurons, a mass of interconnected neurons. There's a synergy. This, and this is, is from this that things like consciousness and intellect arise. And, and it's been proposed that perhaps uh, social insect colonies are analogous to that. You know, each individual on its own can achieve very little, but together they can sort of map the world incredibly effectively and, and produce solutions which are really quite incredible. Yeah, no, I, it, it is really incredible to, to think where there's either very, you know, uh, simplistic central nervous systems or, you know, they're not as connected or whatever inside a very, very, very small insect and that it's able to, uh, to do that collectively and which would, you know, make the argument, right? Which is they, they need to do this to survive. They have to have this, this function. So, so tell us before we continue with the ants, uh, tell us about the, the bees, right? And how they are, how do they use inclusive fitness specifically? How do they deal with conflict? How do they do things with their caste system? What is the, the uniqueness, I guess, of bees as, as much as we can tell? Well, bees are in complete contrast to cockroaches, rather wonderful organisms, of course. I mean, don't get me wrong, cockroaches have their devotees too, and I, and I know a few of them quite well, so they'll probably be furious to be uh, made to be the counterpoint to bees. But the, the fantastic thing about bees is not only what they do for us. You know, they, they, they pollinate a vast number of our most essential crops. They perform well, which is um, absolutely irreplaceable. But the, the really fascinating thing about bees is that there are so many different species that fall on a continuum from complete solitary, uh, com complete, uh, living a completely solitary life to uh, the other end of the scale, animals like the honeybee, which live um, in these wonderful colonies mm. you get all different stages um, from living on their own to living in these massive groups and you get some bees in the middle who sometimes will live on their own and sometimes uh, living in groups according to um, what the conditions are at any one time or in any one season so that i think is one of the most important and interesting things about bees in general um, that we can see the evolution of sociality and before we imagine that it's a one-way process that they're all going from living on their own to living in groups there are certain species which have given up living in groups and have gone back to living more or less on their own so 
you know, there's there's a there's there's an ebb and a flow to to this evolution of sociality. And some some animals decide it wasn't for them. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of the bees that we're most familiar with, I guess that's animals like honeybees or bumblebees um, that do live in colonies. And these are some of the most incredible colonies um, among even even among social insects. So um, honeybees live in these um, wonderful colonies where they um, have this phenomenal life life history where each individual is raised in its own cell in the in the nest. Um, it has a particular progression as it hatches and, and becomes um, an adult bee. It, it first of all cleans its little cell. It then potentially becomes a nursery worker and then eventually becomes um, a forager. One of the most remarkable things is though that this individual will work incredibly hard. It will fly out once it becomes a forager in the latter stages of its life. It will leave the the colony to uh, to collect uh, nectar and pollen, but each single bee can, over its entire lifetime collects only a fraction of a teaspoon of honey. And yet, if you see the honey being taken out of a, a, a largish honeybee hive, there can be just huge amounts of the stuff in there. It's it just shows that each you know each little bee collecting a drop of honey over its entire life. Um, when you scale that up, then you get something which is really quite phenomenal. This, phenomenal, this, this huge amount of honey they produce. And it's, it's an obviously it's an incredibly uh, nutritious and valuable substance, uh, not only for us, but of course for the bees themselves. Um, typically what happens is that you've got a single queen in that colony and she's exuding pheromones. These pheromones are incredibly important to the bee's social life because if the colony smells right, in other words, if they can smell the, the, the pheromone, they know that their colony is queen right, that everything is safe and secure, and they'll, they'll keep working. What happens when the queen starts to fade or when she's, or if she dies is that this pheromone is no longer present. And then it's, it's then that we see the, um, the kind of the breakdown of the smooth social order. They will start to raise... Um, other queens potentially to replace, um, feeding them an amazing substance called royal jelly, which um, flicks developmental switches in the developing um, young's bodies uh, and will put them on the path to becoming um, queens themselves. But the really interesting thing, I think, is that when the queen's grip on the colony starts to fade, the workers often will start to show their true colours. They'll start to lay their own eggs. So the idea of a lot of social insects is that, you know, they're all happy to give up their own reproductive rights to raise their siblings. But when workers start laying eggs, you can see that that fundamental drive is still there. Mm. It's policed out of existence by very strict rules within the colony. Um, so when, when the workers lay eggs, what happens in almost every instance is that another worker will come along and eat those eggs um, to stop them hatching. But occasionally some will hatch. Because those workers are not mated, they'll hatch into males and they'll potentially breed with another female in another colony. Um, so it's kind of worth it for those, those workers to try and cheat the system. But in that, you can kind of start to see the tension that exists in what we had often or perhaps to do hitherto thought of as a you know, a relatively smooth, um, almost idyllic setting where, where all the animals are, are setting aside their own personal goals for some greater good. It's, it's interesting how complex it is for, for, for bees, and obviously we know how essential they are for themselves and for other, um, other areas in, in the kind of life cycle, but then also for humans as well and, and, and things of that nature. There's... Is it, I want to ask about ants because I want to ask about their hierarchy. There's much to do about hierarchies within the animal kingdom, but the ants seem to have this. And so, how do they, how do they govern? And um, in some ways, I think you mentioned in the book that they can enslave other ants or go to war with other ants. Or you know, how, what, what are, what are what are these ants up to that there? You know, there seems to be some uh, 
you know, intergroup conflicts of sorts, or there can be some intergroup conflicts. So how do, how do ants organize and then how do they uh, govern or, or interact with other uh, groups or, or uh, colonies? Yeah, so I, I think the wars that occur between ants on the one hand and termites on the other are some of the most dramatic, um, the most dramatic events in the entire animal kingdom. I mean, the ants will raid termite nests in highly organized fashion, which is, is immediately uh, suggests parallels between the way that sadly we've gone to war in the past. You know, they, they, they attack in columns, they um, they take prisoners uh, on, on occasion. Um, that's referring to some of the slave maker ants that, that, that you mentioned in your question. Um, the fighting that goes on between them is absolutely intense. Uh, in, in some cases, they will take their own casualties back to their own nest to, to be tended to fight another day. I mean, it's really extraordinary. As some of the defences that termites in particular um, will mount against these ants are Extraordinary. The, the, the termites are heavily outgunned, generally speaking, by the ants that attack them. But the termites will throw themselves into the defense. I mean, sometimes literally, some of the older soldiers will plug passageways in the nest with their own heads. So they make themselves into, um, <laughs> into a, a bulwark against the, the, the encroaching ants. One of the most incredible examples I've heard of is um, there's a, a one species of termite which as a particular kind of soldier, again, an older kind of soldier, who will explode uh, when the ant bites him. <laughs> oh, it's absolutely it's wild. wild. It's, it's wild to yeah. think that. It's just wild. <laughs> so will take the ants with them. Or, or, you know, some of the smaller termites, they will attach themselves to the legs of a soldier ant to slow them down so the soldier termites have got more of a chance to, to get hold of them. In your, in your question, you mentioned about... Um, Ants attacking other ants. And one of the most incredible examples of that is in uh, slave maker ants. So these are ants that don't have workers of their own. They rely uh, exclusively on kidnapping ants of a different species from another colony and bringing them back to their own colony to do their bidding. So to do this, um, a young queen from the slave maker species will gain entrance to the um, nest of a different species by all kinds of subterfuge, including chemical camouflage. Wow. What she will do when she arrives there is to locate the queen as, as quickly as possible, lo locate her counterpart. And then she'll do two things. First of all, she'll butcher that queen, but very cleverly, she will coat herself in the uh, pheromones of that queen. So she now smells like that queen. So Ants tend to do things by smell. You know, we're very, very visual animals. Ants are very chemical animals. So now this queen has, has butchered her, her rival and now smells like her. So she's now in possession of a working colony of ants, which she is, she rules over. And she's still very vulnerable, though. I mean, she's still one against many. But with this chemical uh, camouflage, she can, she can hope, at least, to be accepted by the workers by the soldiers, and she can uh, run that nest as her own. What will happen, though, of course, is that although she will be laying eggs, her eggs won't turn into workers. So at some point, there will be a shortage of workers mm. for that colony. And of course, these slave maker ants wouldn't dream of lifting a finger or whatever their equivalent is to do any work themselves. So they're then forced to send out a raiding party to capture workers. Um, which they do, and they're very efficient at it. So they'll march into a colony, uh, they're highly aggressive, capture some developing larvae and bring them back to the colony. But all the, but all the while, the, the issue that the um, slave maker ants have is that their young is being raised by workers of a different species who have, um, if we put it in human terms, they have a grudge to bear. Mm -hmm. um, and if the enslaved ants detects that the young that they're raising, these very, you know, obviously delicate and defenseless young, if they detect that these young are not their own species, if there's a kind of a glitch in the, in the chemical camouflage, then they will, they will kill those um, slave maker uh, larvae. 
So this whole colony of, of slave maker and slave ants is, it's, it's not smooth. You know, there, there's, there's, there's a continual sort of uh, tension between these, these, these two elements of it, as you might expect. And it really is a fascinating area. It is, it's absolutely fascinating to, to, to think about how complex their interactions are. And, you know, we know that there are darker sides of cooperation, right? Cooperation is not always a positive thing. And, um, it can be coercive, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, it's very fascinating to, to, you know, analyze and, and observe the, you know, what ants are up to and what they're doing. And, and you know, again, you have an, a very, very, very small animal, an insect that's able to have all these complexities. And so imagine when you get all the way up to mammals and you get all the way up to humans, you know, how deeply complex, you know, we can be as well. It's, it's, it's so fascinating to see some of the parallels. I, um, I want to ask about uh, birds before we, we move on to mammals. Birds are super fascinating. I mean, they're uh, avian dinosaurs, right? So <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> so they are, they are. I, I remember when I really, I remember watching Jurassic Park, I forget which one, and, and they kind of mentioned that, right? Like, oh, you know, you know, birds are kind of, you know, just modern day dinosaurs. And I was like, oh, it's a movie, and, you know. And then I went and read a bunch of stuff about it. and was like, oh, yes, that's true. Um, <laughs> and I, I have to say, like, probably since then, this has probably been, you know, years and years now, I don't ever really look at birds the same way. Um, so if I'm outside <laughs> and I'm having sitting out and I'm having coffee or lunch or something like that, and I'll just see birds just kind of, you know, bouncing around. I just literally think of, you know, dinosaurs. It's just fascinating to <laughs> think of birds that way. But they have some incredible intelligence. I mean, they, they really do. When you think about the raven, it's a super intelligent uh, bird. Um, but even even when you look at many other birds, they they flock together and they they're the birds in a flock they influence other birds and they fly in a v formation and they have these uh each bird has a role in a formation so just which is i mean again if anyone looks up at the sky and they see birds you know mass amounts of birds flying together or even in in the way in which they make their v formation you know obviously it's you know intentional right you, you can't that can't entirely be random. I think even just to like the, you know, naked eye or just in kind of a, a casual observation. So what can we understand about how, I mean, it seems like a very obvious way of cooperating together of how they can fly together in a flock, how they can fly in a V formation, why they do that. Just kind of tell us a little bit about what the, you know, birds are up to in that, in that sequence. Yeah. So I guess there, there, if, if we, we can be somewhat reductive here, but still there are, broadly two different kinds of bird flocks. Um, one of them is rather mischievously uh, has been referred to as a cluster flock. Um, and that tends to occur among smaller animals. <laughs> I love that too. I love that. Um, <laughs> um, so th th these are flocks without an awful lot of structure to them, as the name suggests. <laughs> um, the, and these tends to, tends to be smaller birds. Um, it's when we start to get to medium-sized birds and larger, that's when you get the V from V formation. So this is when you've got animals about as large as a large dog or larger, you know. So and, and they will tend to, to find these V formations. So there's a great deal of interest in both. Okay. Uh, the V formation is an exceptional um, response to the challenge of flying and saving energy. Um, so for those of your listeners who may not be may not be aware, what happens is that the the birds fly in a kind of chevron. There's a leading bird and trailing off behind it on both sides, slightly behind and slightly to the left or to the right, is another bird, and so on and so forth until you get this flying kind of V shape or arrow going through the sky, arrow head I should say. And the reason for that is that. As each bird flaps its wings, it displaces from its wing tip a vortex of air. Now that vortex, of course, contains energy, and if the, the bird behind and to the side of it can place its wing fairly accurately within that vortex, it gets an energy saving. It's a small energy saving of only perhaps, um, say, 10%. But that kind of 10%, of energy saving over a very long migration can be the difference between life and death. Mm. So this is 
this is why they do it. We 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 realised this from from experiments in, in in wind tunnels and what have you. What we didn't realise was just how amazingly good they are at this. You know, we thought that they roughly probably get it right most of the time. In actual fact, they even they're even able to account for you know thermals for 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 wind speeds what have you. They pretty much in the species species that have been studied at least managed to put the following bird managed to put its wingtip right in the heart of that vortex pretty much every time. They're brilliant at it. They they find these invisible steps through the sky with their wingtips. <clears throat> the other thing about the V shaped V formations is that the bird right at the front of the V isn't saving any energy. It's saving energy for the birds behind it, which means that it's at a disadvantage. But what most birds do that fly in Vs is that they regularly switch leaders. <clears throat> So the most, I guess the, the, the analogy that I make to this in the book is, is if you see a cycle race, you see the peloton. This is a group of cyclists riding together again to save energy. And what you'll see there is similarly a, a, a re relatively frequent switching of leaders. Um, the birds themselves don't coerce any single individual to be in the lead. Um, it seems to be a relatively... Um, well-mannered kind of switch between different positions uh, according to need, which is pretty impressive. The, the cluster flocks, however, operate by a different kind of mechanism. They're operating by each individual bird being aware of, in the case of starlings, seven other individuals. Seven seems to be the magic number. If you're aware of a, a, a small number of neighbours or smaller than seven, then you're not really fully abreast of all the potential possibilities of changes of direction or even collisions that could potentially occur. If you're aware of more than seven, well, that's wonderful. You get a bigger picture, but it's also uh, difficult. It becomes more, more cognitively difficult. So these, the starlings in the flocks, that at least those that fly above Rome, which have been, have been the ones most intensely studied, um, seem to attend to the behavior of seven near neighbors. And when one of those neighbors um, starts to change path, the bird that's monitoring uh, that neighbor can then also adapt its path. And the whole flock manages to stay together and to be coherent and to move effectively. I mean, one of the, the, the first time I saw this personally was uh, in a, a, a city in the north of England known as Bradford. Um, it's... I was, picture the scene, it was, it, was, it was a dark, gloomy, early winter's evening. The lights are on, the pavements are wet, everything feels damp. And then suddenly there's this enormous noise from the sky above, and it was a huge flock of starlings making a colossal amount of noise. Not just with their bills, but every time the flock would turn, there'd be like a whooshing noise as they all changed direction. And they're flying around above the city making this colossal noise, which is almost drowning out the traffic. Um, it was just an incredible sight to see this, this aerial ballet um, that was going on the, above my head. I mean, really extraordinary. When, when I dug down into it, it turns out that we're not 100% sure why they're doing this, but it seems to be the case that they're doing this as uh, an anti-predator manoeuvre. Mm. So there are birds of prey around who will try and take um, any laggards or any isolated individuals, but by operating in this incredibly coherent um, flock, they can manage to um, stave off the interest of, of these raptors. So that's, that's one thing. But sociality um, in birds isn't all about flocks. It's not all about just when they, when they get together. And one of the examples of that is this bird that visits me on my office windowsill, Ken. Um, he first appeared on my windowsill on his own. It would be six years ago now. Uh, it was in the middle of the Australian winter, which, though not cold, can be very wet. Um, <clears throat> he appeared on my windowsill looking absolutely bedraggled, and, and really, he was sort of pretty much a chick. He must have just relatively recently left, left the, the nest. And, 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 you know, you could argue perhaps I shouldn't have, um, but I felt sorry for the thing. So I looked for a bit of food to give him. Um, the only thing that I had was oats. So I gave him a, a little bit of oats, which he, he gobbled up. And... He's been coming back ever since, or at least his family has. It's very difficult to take him apart. But um, 
this spread from one individual to another to another to another until now I have maybe half a dozen of, of, of these birds turned up. Not only that particular species, the noisy miner, but other species, coral ones, uh, magpies have turned up, parrots have turned up. Wow. Um, word has somehow got out among the bird community. So this isn't all about them necessarily spending all their time in flocks, but it's about social learning. It's about social transmission of information. These birds are all somewhat social mm. and all communicate with one another. They're all aware of what each other is doing. And this is a fundamental part of sociality, the spread of information through populations. Mm. It, it, the the social learning component is 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 obviously key for birds, but kind of sometimes wrapped up with that is maybe not with all birds, but many of them they have this incredible memory where they can remember things years later where something was was at, um, and they have this incredible navigation. They can fly thousands of miles, and they seem to know where they're going. You know how is it possible? that they're able to navigate so well. Their, nav their navigation is incredible, but then also their memory for things in space, and I guess you could say time, but you know, to remember where there was food or where they have a nest or where they have you know, various things. What, what can we say about their ability to, to, to learn and to remember uh, and, and then potentially share with, with other, others in their family or in their uh, flock? Yeah, I mean, actually we, I'm <clears throat> sorry, exactly. Yeah, You're absolutely right. I mean, we sometimes disparage birds. We sometimes use the phrase bird brain. Um, and yet, perhaps among all animals, you could make a case that there is a species of bird which perhaps deserves the title of being the, of having the best memory of any animal. That's, um, it's not a, a bird that I talk about in the, in the book because its sociality is relatively limited, but that's, I think I'm right in saying, apologies to ornithologists if I get this wrong, but I think that's a Clark's woodpecker. It's an animal which collects uh, seeds and stashes them, at the, or, or caches them, actually, is the, the more uh, often used word. Uh, but it maintains this incredible memory of thousands of seeds which it, it, it caches over the course of a season and then returns to near infallibly, not completely infallibly, of course, but it has this staggering memory of, of where it's it's where it's hidden these mm -hmm. one by one, hidden them one by one as well, not hidden them in some great pile, but one by one it, it, it stashes them. Um, so that, that's a phenomenal example. Um, to go back to Ken, um, I was a little worried after I'd built up this uh, quasi-relationship with him uh, that when I went on sabbatical a few months after we first become acquainted that he wouldn't remember. But when I returned from sabbatical after six months after being outside my office, uh, or six months since I'd left my office, I returned and he was back on the windowsill 15 minutes after, I, after I'd returned after six months. So he clearly remembered. Um, migrations are one of the most incredible things, I think, that... Um, yeah. that associated with them and they're not the only animals that migrate of course but mm -hmm. no animal flies further than um arctic terns which which you know fly the full length of the earth um on a very regular basis how do they do it um well of course it's not all memory mm -hmm. um we're still learning about exactly how they do it it seems to be that they use um the earth's magnetic field as a means of um, navigating and they can augment that with flying by landmarks as, as pigeons do. Um, but there is certainly an element of memory, particularly for even that birds like Arctic terns, which we, we're thinking potentially are using um, mag the magnetic field to fly, in that the Arctic terns, when they return to their breeding sites, they typically tend to return to a space which is within just a few feet of, um, of, of where they're I were either raised or where they were bred last year. So um, they're incredibly specific. And we've, we've got much to learn, actually. We, you know, we often, in the past, biologists have been guilty of seeing these phenomena um, and really overlooking the complexities that are involved in actually achieving some of these things that animals achieve. It really is quite incredible. 
Yeah, I think it's with corvids, which is usually, you know, crows and ravens, things like that, you know, kind of colloquially termed, you know, primates with feathers, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Because their, their, their intelligence, especially with ravens, I've read a few books on ravens that, I mean, they're incredibly intelligent. I mean, I mean, very, very, very intelligent. Um, and so it's, it, yeah, the whole bird brain thing is, is, uh, is kind of an antiquated term now. I mean, we, we know enough about birds to know they're pretty damn smart. Um, which is, which is interesting. So I guess we'll, we'll move to, uh, we'll move to mammals or predominantly, and we'll start with rats. Um, <laughs> another favorite, another favorite creature of, uh, of, uh, most of us, uh, most people really detest rats. Um, you know, we, we do a lot of research on rats and there's a lot of similarity between humans and rats. I think. Um, I think it's, um, if I remember this correctly, you know, you know, rats, bats, and uh, humans make up a certain percentage of the Earth's, you know, population of all living species on the planet. There's just so many of them on the planet. Um, so, I mean, how are they just, how are rats similar to us as, uh, for, for humans? And, and then um, how, how do they have some version of reciprocity and how, how do they cooperate amongst each other? I think rats, I, I think you're absolutely right. Most people have uh, a fairly strong reaction to rats, and I can entirely understand that. I, um, I had a certain amount of disquiet about them myself when I, was, when I was growing up, but having had a couple of them as pets, they were, they were, they were absolutely excellent pets, actually, and, and very, very trainable. I think the story of the rat um, starts um, as being uh, from when it was a relatively uh, unprepossessing kind of rodent which lived, went its own business um, in what is now an area, of, I guess you'd call it northern China now. Um, but what the rat did, what the, uh, many, many other species didn't quite manage to do, is that they saw an opportunity as human uh, settlements started to grow. And they switched really from being these sort of seed eating middle of the road kind of rodents to exploiting us. So we were the rat's passport. We probably hate them because <laughs> they are ubiquitous in our settlements, but they live alongside us pretty much right across the world. They, they moved in with us. We were, the, we were their passport to greatness. I feel like all their passport to success. Mm -hmm. Way of saying that. And they adapted. They were flexible enough to... Um, to exploit new opportunities, to adapt to the situations that we offered them, um, and to basically live alongside us. Um, so they spread throughout the world. They spread on ships. They spread um, in wagons. Uh, they spread in, in cargoes. And there are very few places in the world now that don't, that don't have rats. Um, they are, as you suggested, kind of a very popular um, organism to study. Um, I haven't actually studied them myself, but um, we use rats because they are like us mammals. They have um, a social tendency. They interact with each other. Um, they are undeniably intelligent, and they're also relatively convenient for study. Um, you can't find something in a rat and then say that applies equally to a human, but it does offer a starting point offers you know if you look at the way that say uh, a rat adapts to a stimulus or to um or, or the way that they interact with each other you can't immediately infer that that's a, that's exactly how humans would do it but it, it it gives us food for thought it gives us a, a foundation that we can then research um on humans i'm talking here about um researching things like psychology rather than things in medical science which really isn't my my area at all so, so, so that's probably why we use rats, why rats are so extensively used as a, as a study animal, particularly in psychology. Um, they're an excellent study animal, and they share, they're, they're, they share a lot in common with, with, with ours, I guess. And, and what is it about, I guess, their ability to have some reciprocity amongst each other? Uh, you talk about yeah, this a little bit in the book. <clears throat> yeah, well, I mean, that I have to admit, I mean, one of the joys of writing a book like this is that you learn as you write. Um, you know, I, I'd hate to give people the idea that everything that's in the book, I knew right from the outside. I, I, I had to 
the, the, the basics in, in my mind. But the more I researched on rats, the more the more I appreciated them for sure. But there were some elements of the research which just blew my mind. Uh, and there were, there were two actually, there were two particular areas that, that blew my mind. One was one of the research of um, uh, a guy who was initially based out of um, Baltimore called John Calhoun. He did some research. He was he was looking at the effects of crowding on behavior. And he used, he started using rats, but also diversified it into mice as well. He, his research question essentially was, it was actually in the context of pest control initially at least, was what happens if an animal has everything except space? Mm. Um, and and, and, he's, and he, was, <clears throat> he was drawing parallels here with overcrowded cities. You know, there were, there were, there were clear parallels in, in his mind between the behavior of rodents and his research on rodents and what was happening in the increasingly overpopulated urban megacities of humans. And so he created these arenas, these large arenas, populated them with just a few rats. And of course, the rats didn't care of everything else. He, he provided them with food. They, they obligingly bred until they filled these places. But then something weird happened, which was that the population reached a certain level and things started to go wrong. The rats, as they became more uh, crowded in their environments, were started behaving aberrantly, started behaving antisocially. Mm. Um, mother rats would ab abort their fetuses. Um, the rats would start killing each other. Some rats would go into a, 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 into a, into a kind of what appeared to be a psych psychological state um, akin to PTSD. They would just sit there huddled and shivering. They, they couldn't function at all. Mm. And, you know, these... Calhoun himself was very quick to draw parallels between what, what he saw happening here, this apparent breakdown in rat society, which was associated with increasing density, and what was happening in certain elements of human cities. Now, um, perhaps his mistake was to draw those parallels too closely, not, not, to be, not to be cautious enough, because, of course, people vociferously argued back against him that really the two, uh, the two species can't be compared quite so directly. But nonetheless, it was fascinating to see that time and time again, every time he did this experiment in a different arena with different animals, that a, a similar outcome would be reached, which is at a certain density, things just went wrong. The social order broke down, um, which I think is, is particularly interesting that social animals are social to a point, but if you enforce sociality on them, if you cram them, crowd them into a particular area, um, without the opportunity for egress or, you know, to, 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 to at least to, to split and to, to go their own way. Something goes wrong with sociality, which I think is fascinating. But more in terms of the altruism that you mentioned in your question, some of the research on that just blew my mind. There's, there's one particular example which really caught my attention, which is the simple experiment where there's a rat in one cage, and everything's fine, everything's right with the world for that particular rat. And there's a rat next door, which is living in a cage where everything's wet and damp and bloody miserable. And <laughs> that rat is in a bit of a predicament. It's living in these awful conditions. But the rat next door has a choice. There's, there's a, a, a door which connects the two cages. And if it wishes, it can go up to that door, open that door, and let the other rat in. Now think about what a human would do in this situation if it didn't know, if, if, you know, if there's somebody living next door to us, we don't know anything about them, but we could invite them in. We'd like to think that the better part of our nature would be to go over to open that door, to let that person in, to give them some uh, warmth and what have you. We'd like to think that, but in practice, we're a little bit cautious, and, you know, with good reason. But what the rats did um, on just about every occasion was to go straight up to the door and let the rat in from the, from the, from the wet environment into the dry environment. Um, <clears throat> which shows a degree of, I don't know whether you would call that altruism. I mean, it's probably altruism. People who argue against it suggest that the rat does this because it wants company. So actually, it's, it's acting selfishly uh, in getting some company for itself. 
it's hitherto been on its own, it's getting some company. But there's no, they, these aren't mutually exclusive arguments, it, really. I, I think, you know, the rat can be operating for its own benefit and for the benefit of the other rat. It can see that um, the other rat needs some help. And this is given strength by the fact that the rat that opened the door, the rat in the nice warm cage, was more likely to open that door if it itself previously had been the rat in the wet environment. So apparently, based on that, it can empathize with a situation having been through it itself um, previously. And so this is one example of many, actually, of, of rats um, being um, unselfish towards one another, to, to uh, uh, helping one another, giving one another uh, soccer and assistance. Um, which, you know, again, the, I guess, like, like bird brain is an insult that we use, which really has very little um, relevance to most birds. When we think about a rat, we think of a, of a, of a dirty creature. A, 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 a rat is somebody who tells tales, right? And somebody who gives up another person or something, rats them out, um, is somebody who is uh, generally untrustworthy. And yet the rats themselves seem to be um, particularly good at um, helping one another out rather than cheating on them. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different... Uh... It's a different, different uh, side of the story that we don't hear a lot about, right? About the sociality of rats, and and I, I think that it, I think you're right. Is you know maybe some people will say that you know the rat will help you know his fellow rat because he wants company or or something for himself, but you know maybe the jury's still out on that about what the intentions are and, and who can know the intention of the rat, right? I mean, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's exactly. uh, very difficult to kind of <laughs> guesstimate at that, but um, yeah. it's very, it's very, very interesting though. Uh, I think, I think so. I think so too. I mean, the, the, the thing about that to me is uh, exactly as you say, you can't know an animal's intention. And so all you can do is, you know, present a balanced argument. Um, I think that's absolutely correct. I, I think, you know, again, like with cockroaches, you know, we can't, completely cover the fact that uh, rats are vectors of disease. They do cause enormous problems. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here to say that, that we should all love a rat and, uh, and what have you. I mean, the, it is a nuanced argument, but their capacity to be good to each other is, is rather more dramatic than I ever anticipated. Yeah. I, I, the, the next question is, is kind of like a kind of a grouping of sorts is, you know, much has been said about, you know, domestication, right? How we domesticated animals uh, in the agrarian period and, and, and even before that. And, and there, was a, <laughs> there, was, there was some positives, but I think most people's uh, kind of final point in this is that it was really harmful for, <laughs> for humans and is very harmful for uh, certain environments. There were some obviously important aspects of it, but um, there was a lot of you know, disease, you know, fecal oral transmission, on and on and on. There's a lot of negatives to it. Um, <clears throat> but I guess, you know, we have many farm animals now, you know, cattle, pigs, uh, you know, uh, goats, sheep, etc. And, you know, I guess this is sort of a, you mentioned it in the book, and, and so, but, but I'm, I'm going to take a kind of slight detour on this you know i guess the, the the question what's relevant here is is you know how aware are they of each other and how much can we say that they're sentient and and then outside of that if, if all of these things are true what are some of the ethics on killing them or raising them or farming them and then killing them um, or housing them and semi-torturing them and then killing them and then uh, eating them. Um, you know, I, I, you, don't have to, you don't have to pick a side here if you don't want to make one side or the other angry on this. I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but, you know, it's, it is a, it's an ethical question that I think that we have. And, and um, so anyways, yeah, so I guess how are they aware of each other, these kind of farm animals? Um, and how much do they, um, you know, communicate with each other or, or acknowledge each other? And then, yeah, kind of the ethics about if these animals are so uh, aware or conscious or sentient, what do we what do we do with that and how we, we treat them and then kill them and eat them? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a huge question. And um, I think I want to start by saying that 
Um, I grew up in the countryside in the north of England, among farmers and farm workers and among farm animals. And I know how hard it is for farmers, certainly in the UK and, and probably around much of the rest of the world, to make a living. I have no intention of uh, besmirching them or, or, or you know, telling a farmer how it is and what have you. I mean, they have it difficult enough as it is. Um, so I think this is really a question which applies to each of us individually about how we think about this. Um, so how aware are they? How sentient are they? They are all social animals. That was the fundamental part that allowed us to domesticate them in the first place. I mean, Charles Darwin wrote about that. For an animal to be domesticated, it's almost, it's almost a prerequisite that that animal should be social. Um, because it's only in this way, as Darwin saw it at least, uh, will they come to accept us as, if you like, the head of the herd. Um, now, whether how important that particular aspect of it is, I'm not quite sure, but it's certainly true that, you know, if we're going to keep animals in, in, in some density, then they pretty much have to be social animals. And so cows, uh, sheep, goats, pigs, uh, chickens, they're all social animals. Um, what I majored on in the book was, was cattle because I guess a bit like the rats, I had a bit of a change of heart about when I was a kid growing up, the uh, cattle I'd see around on the farm, they don't look like there's an awful lot going on in their heads. You know, you can see their, their you look into their eyes, that they don't seem to be particularly curious. There doesn't seem to be much of a gleam of intelligence there. Um, and yet, when you delve down a little bit and you find the complexities of their lives and, and find out what they're capable of, the picture changes somewhat. So what, again, all these animals have in common, as well as being social animals, is that they're all prey animals. Now, it's, it's pretty much fundamental for a prey animal to not show weakness. I mean, the analogy I made was when, you know, a, a new prisoner goes into, into jail, I mean, if he or she looks weak, then he may get, he may get picked on. And there's something similar going on in, in farm animals, or, or at least in their, in their wild antecedents, which is if they're bellowing in pain, if they're looking scared and what have you, that, that's going to draw the attention of a predator who will single them out. So then, to some extent, at least mask it. So what we kind of sometimes take for stolid indifference is something which is fundamental to that animal's behavioural um, repertoire. Now, that isn't to say that, that cattle and sheep and pigs and what have you are, are incredibly intelligent, although pigs in particular are very, very smart animals. Um, they are nonetheless more intelligent than we perhaps sometimes give them credit for. It can be comforting for us to think of these animals as being really just machines which convert feed or even grass into meat. Um, that way, when we buy a pack of meat at the supermarket or at the butchers, we don't have to think too much about it because this is just a very basic animal, an animal with you know, very little consciousness, if any, uh, very little intelligence, if any. But when you research a little bit more about the cattle, you find out really some quite dramatic things going on. Um, so, for instance, I'm doing some research over here at the University of Sydney with um, a group of people who are researching cattle and showing that they interact with each other in, in really quite sophisticated ways. They, they develop um, strong dominance hierarchies within the group. They associate with, with each other in strategic ways. Um, they move around their paddock in a way that looks to us as we glance at them in a fairly random way, but they're interacting all the time. They're very aware of each other. Um, they have close-knit and uh, little herds and um, close ties within those herds. Um, just like with all other mammals, the strongest bonds in any social group in mammals is between the mother and the offspring. And if and when that gets broken, um, as is necessary in modern farming, that causes huge amounts of stress to both uh, mother and offspring. It's the most difficult one is, unfortunately, in the dairy industry because, you know, for whatever reason, supermarkets and retailers started selling milk so cheaply, it put the margins of the farmers on an absolute bare minimum. That means that essentially they have to do everything they can to, to maximise 
uh, milk yields. And that means making sure the calf doesn't get any milk. And that in turn means separating the calf from its mother at a very early age, sometimes um, within the first week, usually, in fact, within the first week. And when you look at what happens um, behaviorally to those animals and physiologically to those animals, you can see these intense stress, um, intense patterns of stress behavior, stress physiology, you see stress hormones. You can see that if the mother and calf are within um, hearing range, they will call to each other <clears throat> after their separation. These animals are not indifferent, in other words, to the situation in which they find themselves. In beef farming, the youngster tends to stay with its mother for a, lot, a longer period of time, almost to the point of where they would break off and, and become more independent in a, a natural setup. Um, they, <laughs> there was one test that was done. I mean, it was, it was a difficult test to run because the animals are so large, but it was, it was to solve a maze. So the animals were, were taught the layouts of 10 different mazes and they had to navigate their way through the maze to get their food. And then on, when it came the time to actually test them, they were given one of these 10 mazes at random. And then they have to work out which maze it is and then they have to work out which, where, where the food is within a, a certain amount of time. I mean, it sounds a bit more like a game show than an experiment, I guess. But um, <laughs> the cows did better at it in this particular instance than uh, dogs, rats, and cats, I believe. Wow. It doesn't demonstrate like, that cows are, are cleverer than those animals, but it does demonstrate that they're not completely brainless, at least. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can't take one single uh, example like that and, and, and say that represents their, their full intelligence. The other thing is, is sheep. Uh, one of the things that have been done in sheep is um, identification of um, other flock mates. Now, sheep, unlike us, have their eyes on the side of their head. They have very little binocular vision going forward, and so they perceive depth differently. Nonetheless, um, they can identify other members of their flocks from pictures. They can also differentiate between humans based on photographs mm. um, and show preferences and what have you. Cattle can do the same. Cattle, in fact, are very, very good at recognizing different humans based on their what they've been wearing or, or, or on their face. So. Yeah, to, I guess to cycle back to, to where we started, these are animals which do an excellent job of convincing us that they're particularly stupid, but they really aren't. They're, they're not super intelligent, but nor are they, um, but, but nor are they the, the, the dumb animals that which we, we often come to portray. And I, I think it's really important that whatever we do, and it's a personal choice for each of us, you know, which, which way we go in terms of, how you feel about eating milk, having dairy products, but we can't brush to one side the idea that these aren't in some way um, intelligent animals that are worthy of, at the very least, our compassion. Yeah, you know, I, I've said this at different points on the podcast, different episodes, but, you know, I'm someone that really enjoys, you know, the taste of meat. I like different types of meat. I, I enjoy eating it, um, I, you know. I, I, it's, you know, it's nice to eat. And <clears throat> I think something that I have really struggled with over the past, we'll call it five years, is, you know, <laughs> the more you read, the more you study, the more you listen, the more you talk, the more you investigate, eh, the more you know. And, you know, it's not like it's one or two things. I mean, it's, you know, things, there's, there's a lot of literature out there now about, farm animals of how uh, aware at least they are of many things kind of everything how you just kind of marched us through all of the components that they have you know they're, maybe they're not you know as intelligent as you know orcas or you know chimpanzees but they're definitely not brainless and they definitely are aware and i think that <clears throat> i'll just say for me i mean i don't other people think differently maybe but you know, it makes it very difficult, I think, um, to, I guess, in good conscience, say there, this animal was probably not treated in the best way before it died. And, you know, if you're getting meat from the supermarket or whatever. And, um, you know, we're, I don't have to eat this necessarily. I definitely don't have to yeah. eat it as much. 
and yeah. it 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 p- puts you in a strange position. Um, and I think that's yeah, like most things, right? This becomes also a question of scale. You know, two hundred thousand years ago, our ancestors would, you know, take a lot of care to, you know, it's very difficult to hunt an animal. Uh, you know, kill it and then use all of its parts, uh, and and that was it. Um, now, you know, if I go to the supermarket, there's you know a whole rows and rows of just meat. So much of it is disposed of; it's not taken care of. You know, so it's just so different, and I think it's a scaling yeah. issue of sorts. Um, but nevertheless, it does become um, quite the conundrum. And so, you know, yeah. I, I'm, I've told people, you know, I, I feel sometimes like the biggest hypocrite, you know, if, if I know yeah. this is true, but I still eat it anyways, you know, yikes, yeah. you know, um, but it is, it is something to continuously think about and to try and, and ponder, you know, how much can you, uh, how much can, can we eat? How much should we eat, if at all, in terms of uh, meat from farm animals? Again, uh, I'm not a, a vegan. I'm not a vegetarian, <laughs> right? Um, so I'm not trying to 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 be influential for any listeners. Um, I I eat meat, uh, but uh, at least for me personally, uh, it is something I think more about. I would say I'm more uh, contemplative about it than I was, you know, five years ago, based on the information. So it's a it's a tough it's a tough thing to sit with. I think that's exactly right. I you know I I'm, I'm not going to start stand on any kind of soapbox and proselytizing uh, my particular viewpoint because that's important only to me. The, 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 the thing that I would love people to do is just like that, to be thoughtful about, um, about the animals that they eat. Um, and it is very easy just to um, see a packet of meat and not relate that to an animal, um, which makes, of course, the whole moral conundrum much, much easier. But if... You know, it, it's it's a question that each of us individually has to, has to think about. I think um, you know what what do we want uh, for the animals that we eat? What do we want a certain minimum standards? Um, and then after that, then you know we can each um, satisfy our own sort of feelings and consciences uh, consciences about. Um, I have my perspective, which is. Um, slightly different to yours, but not perhaps as dramatically as you might imagine. Um, simply because I, at this point in time, I can't imagine a life without cheese. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's the tricky one for me, the most mm-hmm. tricky one. And yet I know the dairy industry is fraught with all sorts of trouble. And again, I, I, I don't blame farmers for that. I, I'm afraid it's more a case of blaming this ridiculous situation we've got into where we're having to pay more for water than we have for milk mm-hmm. in many cases. Um, it's, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a charged issue. And I, yeah, as I say, you know, it just requires people to think. Yeah, well, listen, I mean, that I did not mention that. But, um, you know, I, I'm not a big milk drinker. I don't drink milk. I don't in a lot of milk products, you know, yogurt or you know, ice cream. I, I don't really consume that kinds of stuff. Mostly because I just don't really have an affinity for it but cheese oh man <laughs> that is that is extremely you know I, i'll say this i could give up meat before i could give up cheese 110 percent. it is it is really difficult um i don't think there's a cheese out there i've tried that i don't enjoy i just love all cheese it's just i don't know it's, it's so good and um you know, it is. I'm aware also of of the kind of industry and many of the challenges there. So it's it's also a, a, an added uh, complexity for myself. So, um, okay. So I guess we'll move to the <laughs> the continent of uh, I guess mostly Africa, although elephants aren't just in Africa. But you talk about elephants, lions, and hyenas, and there is differences obviously with them. So, but uh, just in trying to group them, they. You know, we'll start with elephants, I guess. They have a social structure. They have a hierarchy. They're matriarchal. They communicate. They, they grieve. They, have, they deal with death in a certain way. 
Um, obviously, much has been made about their memory. What what can we say about the cooperation and social components of of uh, elephants within their kind of matriarchy and their kind of uh, hierarchical uh, structure? So elephants, as you uh, as you say, are one of the most incredibly intelligent animals. Um, they are they have these extraordinary memories, and they're famous for that. At least that's one of the um, I guess the sayings. That, that is at least true. They, they live in, as you say, matriarchal societies, which means that um, it's a female-led society. Often there is a, a single matriarch, the, the most senior of all the females in there. She may be the grandmother, or in some very rare instances, the great-grandmother of the youngest calves in that group. And the other members of that group will be perhaps her daughters. Um, and so you get several generations living within the same um, little social group. Periodically, they will come together. Different, different uh, little groups of elephants will coalesce into great big herds. When occasionally you may get thousands of elephants all together um, for for short periods of times, and then I mean, I mean, sadly, this is this is more historical than current. But uh, and then when they break up back into their original groups, occasionally some individuals will will swap groups. Um, but the elephants remain incredibly close knit. One of the, one of the most amazing bits of research that came out um, in recent times was working out just how they communicated. Because you could look an elephant and kind of get the idea that it was picking up on something, but what was it picking up on? Was it a smell? Was it a sound where well, we couldn't hear any sounds? You know, what is it that they were attending to? And we eventually learned through some fantastic research that was done um, out of the US, I think, initially, was that um, they communicate extensively by infrasound. So these are sounds which are too deep for us to hear, too, too bass for us to hear, but which transmit over colossal distances, in the case of the elephants, primarily through the ground. So what the elephants were attending to in some of these instances is the vibrations they were picking up primarily through their feet. And what they'd also often do sometimes is to rest their trunk on the ground. And they're picking up these vibrations. Um, in, in a way, it's some way analogous to the idea of us sort of phoning each other. You know, that a signal is coming through and it's then being interpreted by the animal, which transmits through the animal's skeleton um, into, the, into the ear, into the brain. And they can communicate like that over, over kilometers, we're talking here, several kilometers. Um, a, a distance, at least, that a normal call would be either impossible or very difficult to hear. So this is binding them together. They may be separated by you know, considerable distances, yet are still chatting to one another in, in a way. Um, so this way that elephants organize themselves into their groups is pretty much standard for Lots of mammals. It's, it's the blueprint. If you, if you were to release cattle into the wild or they, were, they became feral, they would form these same groups. You'd get matriarchal groups formed by a, a small number of probably closely related females and their calves. The males, just as in elephants, would be um, often on their own, but sometimes in bachelor groups. Um, it's, yeah, it's the standard mammal approach, really. Mm. Closely associated females with um, satellite males. Um, but it's really in the apparent emotional attachments that elephants make that we can really start to empathize with them um, quite dramatically. So there are all sorts of examples where elephants have been separated, often sadly by human intervention, perhaps in zoos, for decades. These are animals that live have a similar lifespan to ours. They may be separated by decades, but then one sniff of a familiar animal, say their mother or, or a close associate from their earlier years, and provokes instant recognition in that animal, and a very dramatic, uh, very dramatic response that they get. And you know, meeting after 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 a, a period of time apart, the elephants go through this remarkable kind of ceremony of greeting, where they'll show intense excitement at seeing an individual they haven't. Uh, encountered face to face for a period of time, there'll be huge amounts of excitement going on um, within within the group and between the, the elephants that are meeting. It's it's extraordinary to see. 
But one of the the, the, the one instance that you, you mentioned that, that gets people thinking, I guess, the most is, is the morning. Mm-hmm. This is rare. Um, it's not exclusive to to elephants. There, there was even a paper I read some little while ago, which which at least implied that it, that it had been uh, observed in peccaries, which is a kind of pig. Yeah. Um, nonetheless, elephants are perhaps the most dramatic exponent of it. There was um, one instance which I, I relate in the book of this small group of, uh, of, of females, and the elderly mother was clearly not going to make it, and she stumbled through and eventually, sadly, fell, and, and, and they tried to, to support her and to keep her upright and to lift her, but um, she died. And the remaining elephants stood around this female in utter silence and just kind of, you know, I guess we would think of it as being respectful and perhaps the elephants too, um, or contemplation, but they were absolutely silent as they surrounded this, uh, this fallen relative, this, I mean, is it pushing it too far to call, call her a loved one? Mm. Um, and they, they stood guard over her. Eventually, of course, they had to leave because while they were accompanying her, they were forgoing food themselves and water, and they'd pushed themselves right to the limit, so they had to leave. But before they did so, they covered her with um, branches and, and earth. I mean, they didn't bury her. That would, that would be an, an intense undertaking for, for anyone. But um, So they, they disappeared. They, they found food and... and some days later, they returned to the exact spot. Now, of course, by then, suddenly nature had taken its course and, and various uh, scavengers and what have you had, had made off with the meat, but they returned to that exact same spot and, and sort of paid their respects at the site uh, where the skeleton remained um, some weeks later. It's, it's a very apparent part of elephants' behaviour that they seem to have this concept of death. And now, you know, this is something that we, that we have, we kind of take for granted. We, we know we're going to die. Not many animals, I think, realise that there is an end to what they're doing. And it changes your perspective on life, of course, very dramatically. So the fact that elephants are capable of this and, and perhaps have this concept of um, tempor- uh, that life is temporary um, makes them really fascinating and and, and and allows us to identify them with them very, very well, I think. Well, there's a lot of things that are kind of implicated in that, right? If they are aware that there's uh, uh, someone in their troop, uh, troop, right? Is that what they're called? Oh, yeah, that's fine, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, they, that, that someone has died. Well, <laughs> there's a concept of death, right? That to be and to not be anymore. But then there's yeah. also an aspect of time, uh, whatever that may be. There is obviously a concept of some element of theory of mind. Yeah. Um, which is high abstraction. Um, yeah. Along with attachments that they have. Uh, so there's just all these things that we have as humans um, that is very likely not limited to humans, but either elephants do it in a different way or in a more simplistic way. But even still, even at a base level, you're talking about, you know, modes of abstraction. You're talking about, you know, attachments with, with others that, I mean, these are, you know, higher order brain uh, ways of, of interacting with, with one's like kind. And that, that again, has so many implications seen, besides the observed fact that they are having a quasi wake or they're having a, a serve, not a service, but they're, they're remembering someone that has passed. And there's a lot of, I, you know, when, when I've read about these things with elephants, uh, it, it, it just has more questions about their, um, you know, how, how high is their ceiling for abstraction, social cognition, um, attachment, etc. It is, it's very curious yeah. in many ways. Absolutely. You talk about, uh, lions, um, and the lions being very social as well. Um, they also are matriarchal. I, I guess maybe just a footnote here. 
is it by accident that it's many of these um, uh, animals that are social are uh, matriarchal? Uh, is there something to do with that? I mean, you know, not all of them, obviously, um, but it's interesting that the ones that, you know, I think there's at least, what, nine major uh, animal groups that are have a matri matriarchal kind of system and hierarchy, and it seems to be that they're, a majority of them are pretty social. Um, you know, what can... Yeah. What can we just say about that in general, but then also how to, you know, how does it work with the lion pride? How do males and females kind of split their roles, you know, et cetera? Yeah. So in, in mammals, the reason for the matriarchal societies is pretty much one that's forced on the females, I guess, which is that they lactate. So they're in charge of feeding those cubs in the case of the lions. Um, they provide extended care to the young as they grow and they provide their nourishment when they're, when they're very young. So really that's, that's, the, that's the basis for it. Uh, the relationships between those animals grow particularly strongly, uh, grow particularly strongly. And um, from that comes the interreliance in many cases between different females, um, often helping to raise each other's young. So providing a little bit of support in, in one of the most challenging jobs that any animal can do, which is to raise their offspring. Um, so, so that's where, where, where that comes in. The, the males have different priorities, of course, which is based on theories of, of sexual selection, which is um, in these species to mate with as many females as possible. Um, it's a little different for lions in particular because um, the cubs face an intense amount of aggression from any individuals from outside their pride, and also indeed from animals of different species. So a lion cub is very vulnerable to an animal like a hyena or a, or a leopard, um, as well as to other lions. So the male lions, when they take control of a, of a pride, usually by extreme violence, uh, it's an awful thought, but the first thing the males tend to do when they take control of a pride is to kill the young that are already in that pride. And there's not a great deal that females can do to stop that um, because they're outweighed and outmuscled rather substantially by the, by the males. The reason the males do this is not because they're psychopathic killers, but really because rather like a prize fighter, like a, like a heavyweight champion, they have a finite amount of time where they're at their absolute physical peak, when they're strong enough to be able to defend a pride. And I think I'm right in saying the average for that is about 18 months. They've got about 18 months at their absolute peak before they, they in turn will be driven off by uh, up and coming males. Um, so in that 18 months, they've got to fit in a full cycle of um, reproduction to raise those cubs to the point which they become independent. This is their only shot, really, realistically, um, under normal conditions of breeding. And that is why they kill the existing young, because the females won't come into heat, won't breed with them, won't go into estrus until they have no cubs. So if they were to be nice guys uh, and to behave what we would think of as entirely normally, then they would spend an awful lot of time waiting for the females potentially to raise the existing cubs and to send them on their way before they turn to breeding with the new males. But the, the incoming males just don't have that time. And so you get this awful infanticide going on, which is a, it's, it can be really hard for people to accept, you know, that you see these sort of majestic animals, animals that we associate in the case of lions with, with courage and fortitude and strength. And yet, you know, they routinely kill comes um so yeah the lion society is, is an unusual you know they're, they're the only one of the cats which is social and the reason that they're social the reason they, they're, they're compelled to band together is pretty much other lions um a soldier lion will be displaced from territory by a pair of lions a pair will be displaced by a trio and so on if you're living in a group you are you have some element of a surety about your ability to hold your territory where wherein you'll find the prey animals that you need to eat and the water you need to drink. So um, sociality in lions is compelled by the aggression of other lions. It's, it's interesting, right? Because I think that they, 
they have all these unique ways of functioning um, with with themselves, and yet they have these uh, <laughs> this this type of um, interaction, I guess you could say, with with another animal in in their vicinity with hyenas. And uh, they're super fascinating. Uh, you talk about in the book how f- female hyenas are very dominant. Um, they have this uh, very unique set of genitals with their social erections, which w- I did not know about this. It was, it was <laughs> absolutely <laughs> fascinating to me. I was very <laughs> I had raised eyebrows when I was reading this part of the book. Uh, so, and they have some element of status and power, and you know. So, so what is it? What can you say about these you know, very interesting uh, creatures and hyenas, and and all of these aspects of their uh, sociality and things like that? Oh, I tell you, when 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 I was about to go to Africa for the first time, I was beyond excited. I mean, it's it was you know the the, the most exciting thing I could imagine doing. Just after all these years of watching documentaries about reading about these animals to actually go and see them was just a dream. And where does it, I mean, everybody's different, but where does it might seem to, to perhaps some of your listeners, the two animals that I was desperate to see were hippopotamus and hyenas. Mm. I couldn't tell you why, except I know that hyenas absolutely kick ass. They are amazing animals. They are, I mean, they're, they're thoroughly besmirched by, um, all kinds of you know cultural references. We think of them as being dirty scavengers and cheats, uh, all sorts of absolute nonsense. I mean, this isn't just among uh, Western um, sort of cultural uh, I- ideas, but also um, in Africa, in, in parts of Africa, there, there are certain cultures who think of us hyenas as being the uh, the steeds of uh, of witches who ride around on the backs of hyenas. So. Wow. It's it's pretty it's pretty consistent throughout mm. that all the cultures that think of hyenas at all think of them and uh, think of them poorly. Now, um, so how should I start to, to write that? First of all, um, we have the idea of hyenas as scavengers. You know, you see a documentary, the lions are eating; they're surrounded by hyenas, and you think, get your own bloody food. You know, mm. put it out for yourself. But what has happened in most of those cases? is that the hyenas have made a kill, and a hyena kill is a very, very noisy affair. The lions have pricked up their ears. <clears throat> Excuse me. The lions have pricked up their ears and have uh, just gone in and taken possession. They're vastly larger than a hyena and can simply just go and displace the hyena. Um, in certain parts of the Serengeti, hyenas kill 90% of their own food which is dramatically more than lions do. So these are out, these are these are not primarily scavengers, these are primarily hunters. The other extraordinary thing I think about hyenas is this, as you've alluded to, it's one of the few mammal societies where the females are absolutely utterly in charge. I mean, matriarchal societies, uh, the little groups are dominated by, by by females, of course, and they form the nucleus of the social group. But in hyenas, the males are in that social group, but occupy very, very low positions uh, in the hierarchy. The lowest ranking female is ranked higher than the highest ranking male. It's, it's just the way that hyenas live. Mm. These are hyper aggressive animals though, to the point that um, if a female gives birth to a pair of cubs, the chances are that one of the cubs will start to try and kill the other one, perhaps even before they're born. Um, they will sometimes attack them prior to birth, and, and in the den itself, will uh, will often attack their siblings. They're born with razor sharp teeth and what have you. They they're, they're born fighting, and the females in particular are born aggressive. And then you get all sorts of other things. So, like um, if one of the dominant females has a daughter, that daughter will. <laughs> I mean, I guess you can think of parallels in human society. You know, high ranking persons offspring will start to lord it over people that they think they're superior to. And, and that happens just as much in uh, hyena, uh, hyena society as well. So for a male, it's very, very difficult. You know, they're, they're put upon by the females quite dramatically. And then really their only chance to go and breed is to join a neighbouring clan. Now, these clans are 
in, in normal hyena density is almost perpetually at war. So these males, these brown-beaten males, have to cross. They have to leave their own clan and join a separate clan where they will be. They'll get at the very least a frosty reception. Um, the worst, they could be severely attacked. And even if they're accepted, it takes years. And added onto that, they have to join the social hierarchy on the very, very bottom rung of the ladder and fight their way up and hope to find their way into the favours of um, a female. And now the, the other thing that you mentioned, which is just bizarre, is the social signalling that goes on. So you sometimes see in large gatherings of hyenas, um, a subordinate approaching a dominant, literally on its knees. I mean, their, their, their legs are art articulated in the same way that, say, dogs are, although they actually, if anything, slightly more closely related to cats than dogs. Um, they approach on their on their elbows, sort of wriggle up to one another. Um, or they do this thing which you alluded to, this, this social erection, which is, I mean, Oh, where do you even start with that? So the, the genitalia of, of, of female hyenas is such that um, the uh, clitoris and labia are fashioned into what looks very look like very look looks very much externally like a penis and testicles, to the point that there have been numerous accounts in zoos previously where they thought they had uh, two males and then they've bred wow. <laughs> because they look relatively alike. But this display they do, which is, as, it's, as it suggests, um, sort of a, a sign that in primates would be one of sexual excitement, is really a, a dominant thing. It's, it's a show-off thing. It's a thing to, to cow the other one into submission. And unless the dominant responds appropriately, which is to hunker down and to, to demonstrate complete subservience, then nasty things are going to happen. Mm. So they have all this extended um, patterns of, all these extended patterns of dominance communication within the hyena clan. And all, but all of this is there to minimize the amount of time they actually spend fighting. So, so long as they, so the, the correct social mores are observed and the, 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 the credit is given to those to whom credit is due, so long as all that is, is observed, the hyena spend very, very little time fighting. Um, so it's a way in this potentially hyper-aggressive animal to minimize um, damage being done within a clan. And I should say, one of the reasons I like hyenas is not just because of their ridiculousness and their, their, their sort of the, the craziness of their social situation, but their sheer intelligence. Mm. Um, when they hunt an animal like a zebra, for instance, they approach it strategically in a completely different way. They'll all gather together beforehand in the clan in a way which is completely different to that which they use for any of the smaller prey animals they hunt. They almost have a debrief before they set off and then they head off as a group in a particular direction to, to tackle this, getting on for half a ton of, of prey animal and then, and then hunt it down. They, so they adopt, that's one thing, they adopt different strategies for different um, prey animals. It's almost like in, in, in American football, we have, you know, where they all get together, they get in yeah, the huddle, huddle, and then yeah, yeah. They, they break, okay, and then they go to the line, and then they run the play, right? And then they go back and yeah. they do it again. It's very interesting. Exactly. <clears throat> There's been experiments on, on hyena intelligence, particularly in the form of co cooperation, where um, it required two hyenas to pull a rope simultaneously to get access to, to food. And once they'd worked that out, then they would work in perfect collaboration to achieve this thing to an extent that even chimpanzees found difficult. Um, one, one, of the, one, of the, one, one of the most, my most favorite examples of, of hyenas, uh, which kind of changed, changed the way I felt about them, was it was um, a, a famous um, African biologist, Hans Crook. He had a, a pet hyena called Solomon that lived with him, lived in his tent. Wow. These are, these are big animals. These are stock animals. You'd mm -hmm, think mm -hmm. this animal was apparently made a, a beautiful pet whilst he was out on the savanna. Would warn him if, if lions were around and all sorts of stuff. Would would, would cohabit with him, never cause him a, a moment's problem. Until unfortunately, they would get near to um, the sort of game reserve hotels where if Crook ever went into one of these things, 
<laughs> like we were saying before, this this hyena Solomon was obsessed with 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 cheese and with bacon, and <laughs> barge its way in. It's got its hefty size would barge into the um, into the buffet and would, would help itself <laughs> <laughs> which must have been a, a rather enlightening for the other diners but in the end, he unfortunately had to, to give Solomon up and Solomon went to live in, in a zoo but um, apparently he made a fabulous pet and uh, hyena keepers at various zoos have, have echoed that they are apparently I mean not that I'm mean, advocating for a mum anybody keeping one as a pet but they are incredibly affectionate creatures which runs counter Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's, that's very, very fascinating to to see it that way. I mean, again, I feel like most people either, right, they have a, you know, nature documentary or or The Lion King is is their most uh, go-to reference about about hyenas. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of things to learn from them. I also find them interesting. Uh, I don't know if they are actually laughing, but their kinds of vocal intonations they make is, is, is I think, just amusing to me to, to watch them do that. <laughs> um, they're That's very interesting. Kind of, that laughing thing they're doing is actually, a, 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 again, a gesture of subservience. It's, mm. a, it's a pacifier. Mm. Stop other um getting aggressive with them. Mm. It's not, there's, there's no joy in it for a hyena. It's, it's a scared hyena that makes that noise. Oh, well, that's, that's terrible to, to, to think about it then. <laughs> it's terrible then. Um, I guess the last thing about the hyenas then is, is what is it that we understand that makes them aggressive? Is this genetics? Is this hormones? Is this, you know, what is it that's, that's kind of yeah. fueling the, the aggression? I mean, obviously we know uh, many things about the uh, testosterone levels in, in many different types of animals and typically in males, although also in females as well. But what is it that we know about, um, about uh, hyenas and, and being highly aggressive yeah. or, can, or can be well, highly I, aggressive? <clears throat> yeah, well, the, the, well, one of the key things is that the, during early development, the females seem to have high concentrations of androgens and in other words, testosterone is one of which, you know, my, my hormones, um, which wires their brain in a different way to the females of many species and makes them more aggressive than otherwise they might be. Mm. Um, by the time they're adults, however, the females don't have any more testosterone than the males, so it's not entirely sort of current levels of testosterone, but we think it's levels of, of androgens um, during early development that, that changes their developmental profile and makes them into this uh, more more aggressive. Um, mm. It's a question that's, that's still being researched because it is unusual uh, among mammals to have a society which is where, where the females are uh, always consistently um, the top of dog hyena, I guess, in this case. Mm. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's it's a you know, in, sometimes in the exceptions we find. We find some of the most interesting parts of, of biology that helps us to understand biology in the round. And hyenas are an exception mm. in that sense. Mm, yeah. So I have a uh, two more groups of uh, uh, animals to to discuss, and it's just really we're just kind of moving up, I guess, the the, the ladder of sorts in terms of like, I usually think of you know brain development or very high social sociality. So the the, the next group is, uh, I guess, you could say. Um, baleen whales and then toothed whales is, is really how it comes down yeah. i guess on the taxonomy of you know because you know, dolphins are a type of whale actually and orcas and yeah. always, you know, there's, there's i think the right distinction is is baleen whales and, and uh, uh yeah. whales how do we understand how you know a little bit of how they communicate obviously they're we we understand them to be you know very social uh, some people claim that maybe more social than humans in some ways you know how there's they're highly 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 social um and there's still a lot of question marks around you know what they're up to but um i guess typically how do they communicate and how do they you know things like you know whale whales and dolphins you know they're not exactly the same obviously you know they can interact with each other we've seen dolphins and orcas together uh, you know there's just there's just different types of um sub sub uh, uh, species that are interacting and so how do they how do they work to work together and how do they communicate i'll, st- I'll start with a baleen whale so baleen whale is um a relatively smaller subdivision of the very very large whales including blue whales and humpback whales and so on so these are these are whales uh that feed by basically filtering small animals out through uh taking usually or 
I shouldn't, not, not always, but usually taking large gulps of, of, of water, including their prey, and then straining out through, through their baleen. And because these, as adults at least, tend to be seen relatively more commonly on their own, or perhaps just with a calf or what have you, we assume that they weren't particularly social, that they weren't really interacting that much. And this is, you know, we, we, we make an observation and we build a case around that observation without really thinking about it too deeply. But it, it became apparent that, say, humpback whales, of course, can communicate over vast distances because water transmits sound so beautifully, both faster and with less, um, with less loss. And so even though geographically, as we looked at them, they appeared to be solitary, they're actually maintaining contact with other individuals which are, you know, tens of kilometers away, perfectly easily. And one of the most dramatic things, I think, um, one of the most dramatic examples of, of just how socially entrained, perhaps, some of these animals are, it came from an observation by um, a guy called Robert Pittman. Um, and he observed, or made a series of observations, actually, about, about humpback whales hearing orcas on the attack, they would change course, go to the epicenter of that attack and start attacking the orcas, which is quite a thing to do. And it didn't matter what the orcas necessarily were hunting in these cases. They, they might be hunting a seal or a sea lion or um, a different species of whale or, or, or whatever it was. It didn't matter to the, to the humpbacks who were engaging in this that it was a humpback being targeted, that some of these humpbacks would just um, <laughs> would just go a little bit crazy and, and, and go and attack the orcas. Each one of uh, the, uh, the, the humpback's pectoral flukes weighs, you know, in excess of a ton, and it's studded with all these tubercles that can knock the hell out of anything, pretty much. So they're, they're not without their own kind of means of attack. Um, and so this idea, I, I mean, that, that is only, it's, it's a series of observations, but nonetheless, it, it gives the light to the idea that these are isolated, solitary, indifferent animals who are indifferent to uh, a, social, um, a social interaction. They are strongly motivated. We just haven't understood them properly until now. Going more onto communication, though, one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my whole life, once I mentioned in the book, was um, when a few years ago I was in the Azores, which is uh, a group I was writing them pretty much in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, um, around which there is a population of sperm whales, a resident population, so meaning they don't migrate. Um, and as biologists, we were able to get, very fortunately, the permits, the extensive permits required to be able to get in the water with them. Um, although, of course, it has to be done on the whale's terms. So a boat would take us out. They would find, um, say, a pod of sperm whales traveling along. The boat would drop us a couple of kilometers in front of that sperm whale trajectory. And then we'll, the boat would get the hell out of the way, of course. And then it was entirely up to the whales whether or not they came up to us. Um, you know, if, if they chose to change course a couple of kilometers out, then, you know, the, we, we'd know nothing about that. We just simply wouldn't see them. In almost every case, the whales would come up to us, sometimes come near us, check us out, make these deep booming sounds with which they, um, they investigate things. So they, they, they have eyes, of course they do, but they rely extensively on, their, 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 on acoustics to, to learn about their environment. So they're essentially, if you like, uh, using biosonar, echolocation, to find out about us. They fire out these intense pulses of sound that make the whole body kind of vibrate. And obviously some of that would bounce back to the whale, which would presumably then get a picture in its mind of what you looked like. But this one particular day we went out and um, there was a largish pod of sperm whales, mm -hmm. um, a matriarch, possibly her daughter. There, there could have been three generations there, but in any case, there were five or six um, sperm whales hanging around. But there was this one particular day when we turned up and there was a, 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 an unusually large pod, at least for that area of, of sperm whales. There was potentially three generations of sperm whales, a large matriarch and some, some smaller females with her, potentially her daughters, even her granddaughters. Um, and alongside them was a bottlenose dolphin, which mm. 
very unusual in itself. But this bottlenose dolphin had apparently some kind of scars. It had a very bent spine. It was apparently fit and healthy, but it was hanging out with these whales. Um, and when they reached us, oftentimes the, the sperm whales would hang out with us for a short while and, and, then, and then move on. Um, obviously, it's entirely their choice. In this particular day, when they reached us, they just started to have what you can only describe as a, as a whale party. They started rolling around and frolicking. The dolphin was in there with them, and they were just having the best time. And all the time, when we're talking about communication, you could hear this click, 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 click. Oh, wow. wow. It's, this is what's known as a coda. It's usually, usually three, not always three, but usually three close beats of sound going on. And this is the whales essentially conversing with one another. Um, to what extent and to what detail, we simply at this point don't know. And then occasionally there'd be the, the, the slightly higher squeak of the dolphin as it communicated with them. But there was a constant chatter between all of these many animals as they, as they sort of followed around. Um, and then the most amazing thing happened, which was that the matriarch opened her mouth, which is pretty substantial in size, and the other whales that weren't small in some cases would take it in turns, then from something close to a queue, would swim sideways into her mouth so that their middle was in, in her mouth and their head and tail protruded from either side. She would give them a very gentle nibble and then she would swim off, the, 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 would leave, leave her mouth and swim off and the next one would swim in. And they, they took it in turns doing that, including the dolphin, which also did it. All the time they're communicating. Um, we don't know, we can't know at this point, and perhaps we never will, what they're saying to each other. Mm -hmm. But it was... The, the thing that struck me was, was not only this, this tactile communication that was going on between them, but also the, the, the acoustic communication. Mm -hmm. the, the one animal amongst all these cetaceans that we're discussing, which is perhaps best known in terms of its acoustics, is the bottlenose dolphin, which um, obviously there was one hanging around with these whales. Um, possibly with the whales because of its scoliotic uh, spine, which possibly... I'm guessing meant that it couldn't swim at the tremendous speeds that bottlenoses often do swim at. Um, so it had associated with these, these whales and its desire to be social, if not with dolphins, then at least with something. Um, but bottlenose dolphins have this incredible thing known as a signature whistle, which is unique and idiosyncratic to that particular individual. And essentially, we think, amounts to them giving out their name so they develop their signature whistle as cards, although they don't take it direct from their mothers. They're more likely to take it from occasional visitors on the periphery of the social group. And they mold and shape their signature whistle over the first few weeks and months of their lives until they settle on what is their distinct signature whistle. And then they'll use that in communication. So we, we, we could make it perhaps a comparison to the way we use names. Um, they seem to announce themselves with this signature whistle. And sometimes there are even occasions when two dolphins meet and one of them will use the signature whistle, the other one will hear it and then call back that same mm. signature whistle almost as though they were using the name. And it's, it's really one example among, I asked we said many in bottlenose dolphins of just what sophisticated social animals they are. Yeah, I, 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 every time I hear this, I, I've, I've seen a few documentaries and I've, I've actually read a few papers and I've talked to a few people and it just, it just blows my mind. You, you, it's, it's like one of those things where anyone I've talked to about this is, is always saying there's, there's a lot going on. Like it's a whole language. It's, they're definitely communicating. There's so much yeah. and we just can't, as you know, humans, we just don't know what that whole world is like it maybe yeah maybe we'll figure it out but you can definitely tell that there is a whole lot of of um i don't know if you're going to say intentionality but it is definitely something that is um purposeful right it's something it's not random and uh and the communication is, is 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 incredible it's incredible how they communicate across long distances um they have different dialects it's it's it's, yes. it's 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 insane it's it's just absolutely insane and again just just shows that we're not we are definitely not the only intelligent creature by a long shot
on the planet. No, we're not. Uh, we're not unique. I mean, we are. No. We are impressive in all kinds of ways, but we're not unique. Absolutely. Well, you know, I, the last uh, uh, animal or group of animals is uh, chimps and apes and monkeys and and all these are, are, are cousins that we share so much DNA with. You know, obviously, there's been a lot said about um, uh, primates. Um, how, in your mind, or what is the, I guess, emphasis for you on, you know, how chimps cooperate together? How is it similar and dissimilar to humans? How uh, some monkeys use deception, <laughs> right? And and I guess, you know, we obviously do that as well, but how is it different? Just, just tell us kind of a little bit of the ways in which they cooperate and how they, they, they also have... Uh, you know, heavy elements of sociality. I think whenever we're dealing with primates, we, we, we look and we find some of the most extraordinary parallels between them and us. And, and that and with good reason, of course, because we are ourselves primates. But you, you referred there to, to deception, and there are some fantastic examples of that among primates, because that requires an individual to try and put itself in the place of another animal to try and predict what it will do, mm-hmm. try and think about how it can manipulate it. And of course, we're all too familiar with the idea of manipulating. Yeah. So um, there are examples with vervet monkeys, for instance, where individuals might give an alarm cry when uh, a particular predator approaches and they have alarm calls which are very specific to the predator, which will produce a very specific response in the other members of the of, of the vervet monkey group but there are some um, reports that occasionally subordinate individuals within that group will spontaneously give well actually maybe perhaps not spontaneously but they will give a call in an inappropriate situation and sometimes when there's food around so the subordinate would normally have to wait to get his share of um, some kind of um, collected food resource but if it gives an alarm cry, the other members of the group will panic and run off and give us a button at just a moment to, uh, to get access to the food on its own. <laughs> so um, th- there are people, uh, of course, who want a little more proof that it's that, and, and, and they suggest perhaps that individual was just highly nervous at that particular moment and that they, the call it gave was a spontaneous sort of explosion of fear. But there does seem to be some evidence that there's manipulation going on, but the best manipulation, or at least deception, that, uh, that we know of comes probably from baboons. Again, one of my favorite animals, and an animal which I saw a great deal of in, in Africa, which was that you get these situations when aggression will escalate or can escalate. And sometimes they use deception to, um, to scale that down. So, for instance, um, so... Baboon society is fairly modular. You get these little groups of, uh, the, of little matriarchal groups within the, within the broader troops. You'll get a mother and her offspring, perhaps her sister and her offspring. That'll be one little modular group. And then there'll be an, another modular group of uh, another female, perhaps with her offspring, and, and so on and so forth. So you get all these little bubbles within the, the, the larger group. And there's a strong hierarchy between the females. So they're really high ranking females. Um, just completely, um, well, they, they make the lives of the subordinates often a bit of a misery. But like I described before, the, the, the daughter of a dominant individual will be perfectly confident enough to strut up to some, um, to some fully grown um, adult and just basically bully them. And there's not a great deal that the subordinate can do in that, in that instance. Um, it has to pretty much comply or face the wrath of the dominant mother who will make its life even more of a misery. I don't know. Um, I'll just say that there, this is one instance where there, where there was an adult baboon who had apparently had quite enough of being pushed around and got a bit aggressive with one of these mm. little pretenders who was bossing it around. And so um, gave chase and, 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 and started threatening all kinds of, of violence in, in, in whatever, um, <laughs> by whatever means that... Uh, Baboons communicate these things. Mm-hmm. Whereupon the highly ranking uh, relatives of this juvenile suddenly showed up and, and tables were reversed. And suddenly this individual who had got frustrated and chased this youngster was now being approached by a cohort of, 
of, of other people's intent on doing a bit, bit of damage. And with, with beautiful, quick thinking, this other baboon did this thing where it, it stood on its hind legs and looked into the distance exactly as it would if another foreign troop of baboons was approaching or if a predator was approaching. And just as they were on the point of about to, to, to beat it up, they all stopped and saw, saw this behavior and went, huh, <laughs> looked in this particular direction to see what was going on. And, you know, this could be a real danger. They've got to, they, everything gets dropped for, a, for a, a, a clan war. And apparently, in the time that it took, the couple of minutes it took to establish the fact that there wasn't a predator approaching, there was no other clan, they'd kind of forgotten why they'd gone there in the first <laughs> The situation was diffused. And the, uh, this smart baboon managed to escape its, uh, its life. <laughs> So it, it was very funny. It, it, you can see where the deception can sometimes be very helpful. So he doesn't yeah. get his ass beat. Um, yeah. Right. Of course, you could obviously use deception for for nefarious intentions as well. Obviously, Absolutely. there's many many things to say about various primates. I guess the I have, I have two questions. I guess the last questions are the, the one last question is, you know, I don't think you talk about it obviously as much in the book, right? But what do you how do you see or understand or think about cooperation and sociality for humans? And what does that look like distinctly for us, you know, juxtaposed with all of these other animals and, that are social and, and many others you don't list as well? How do you, yeah. where do we sit yeah. kind of in, in proximity to all of these other, you know, social animals? Yeah, I mean, I'm, we have two very close relatives. Uh, the chimpanzee is the one of those two that we've focused most on. And we used to think of them um, back in, up to probably the mid 20th century as being peaceful, easygoing, frugivorous creatures who got on with each other relatively well, not with occasional flare ups. But it was really the work of Jane Goodall um, who really brought to our attention the fact that these animals were a mix of all sorts of different, um, a mix of all sorts of, of, of different impulses and intentions and, and, and feelings. And that occasionally this extraordinary aggression could break out between them. And I don't know whether it says, it, 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 this, this speaks to her because being a woman or, or you know, because she was overturning uh, decades of received wisdom but she initially just wasn't believed people refused to believe that chimpanzees were doing this and now we know of course that she was perfectly correct and was reporting things absolutely um impeccably yeah and you now get an idea of the chimpanzee our closest relative is this nuanced animal which can which can occasionally be um homicidally aggressive and can occasionally be incredibly cooperative and i think tension exists in people, I mean, not, not many of us go to those extremes of, of, of aggression, but, you know, we, we, we are complex animals, just like the chimpanzees and presumably the common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees. We are complex animals. We have both the ability to be aggressive, to be competitive, to be aggressive, to be dominant. And we have the, we have the countervailing possibilities of being cooperative and helpful and sociable. Um, and all humans are a balance of these, these two things. Um, the aggression of chimpanzees, you know, some years ago was used as a justification for, you know, why we are, um, why we occasionally commit these awful acts because it's written into our genes somehow that um, this aggression is like, like in the chimpanzee, something that is, which is born inside us. <clears throat> and so therefore that gave us if not an excuse, then at least a reason for why we can be hyper-aggressive at times. <clears throat> and so, you know, in, in that extended to spheres of, of sort of, you know, business and, and commerce and competitiveness. And, you know, the, the only way you can get ahead is by, by standing on somebody else and what have you. And, and, and sometimes that can be given as, as, as the idea that um, this is what you need to do to be successful. You need to outcompete other people, put them down, and what have you. I tend to find, I mean, it differs in different fields, but we, by, take, by taking this approach, by taking this viewpoint, we 
we really do underplay the one thing that has brought us the greatest successes throughout humankind's history, throughout civilization, which is our ability to combine forces, to, to, to cooperate with one another, to, um, to work together for things. These are the things that have made us successful. One individual may get ahead by being hyper-aggressive in a certain context, but humanity as a whole has been successful because we can cooperate, because we're social. So I don't know whether that's a good answer, but, but it is these, the, the, we have these two, ten, the, the, these two competing forces, the tensions between them, and each of us differ in terms of how we adopt these things. But we should never forget the fundamental and primary role that corporations play in terms of boosting our species as a whole. Yeah, yeah, it, you're you're absolutely right. I totally agree with you. I mean, um, I, you know, I've I've talked to uh, Nicola Rehani, I've talked to Michael McCullough, and they've talked to and, and others that have you know talked about cooperation, and they said the same thing more or less, right? You know, they're coming at it from different angles, but they've said the exact same thing. You know, we, yeah. cooperation has helped us as humans, and it helps other uh, animals on the planet as well to survive, to thrive, to to continue to to go for generations and obviously there are dark sides of cooperation there are dark sides of humanity there's dark sides of for many uh, animals and and uh, whether they know it or not and you can put whatever moral or ethical top spin you want on it and you know okay fine but there is also this uh, big component of you know many animals um and uh, especially for us as humans, where cooperation also is huge for, for us. And so, you know, kind of along with that, my, my last question, you sort of answered it. My last question, though, was why, do, why is all this important? Why, why, do we, why should we care if animals cooperate in all these different types of animals? Like, why should we care that they're cooperative and they're social? What is, it, what is the significance, I guess, or what is the big, you know, takeaway from, from you know, studying and understanding and all these different types of animals of their you know cooperation and sociality well yeah i, I exactly so we we, we live in we, we are complex animals we on the one hand there are people out there who are happy to give blood to a donate blood to that will go to a complete stranger out of the goodness of their heart and there are other people who would mug somebody for five dollars so how do we reconcile that i think too too much emphasis in the past has been given on competition to the idea that you need to break somebody else to get ahead. The other part is really that we've too often seen ourselves as being separate, as being um, a unique case, as being separate to all the other animals. Whereas what I'm trying to show in this book is that the foundations of our sociality, all of these different elements of our sociality can be seen in some form or another in animals, not necessarily just in the amazing, sophisticated and complex primates and cetaceans, but also in some cases in the simplest animals, even such as Antarctic krill, for instance, or, you know, or, or, or ants, insects, which is, as you said earlier, are not um, characterized by their intellectual prowess. We are the product, like they are, of millions upon millions of years of evolution, which have shaped our behavior patterns, which have given us this, this ability to be both cooperative and competitive um, and understanding that but giving due importance to cooperation rather than just to competition I think is was one of my main reasons for writing this book and also to, to really reinforce the point that our behavioral repertoire didn't appear out of nowhere but we are social animals like so many other social animals and that the basis of this sociality can be seen throughout the animal kingdom. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a wonderful way to put it. And uh, I, I, um, I, I think that that comes through in your book. And, and hopefully uh, everyone that's listened has, has really uh, taken that away. And, and, and of course, it's, it's super, super fun to, to, to learn about different, uh, different animals and things in the natural world. And so you, you do a great job of explaining that. Um, the book is called The Social Lives of Animals, How Cooperation Conquered the Natural World. Uh, where can people find this and, and uh, where can people find you and all your work? So um, they can find the book in most bookshops or online. Um, it's released 
on the 1st of March in the US. It's already out in the UK. Um, and yeah, I really hope that people enjoy it. They can find out about me if they, they simply search, search my name and the book title and we'll find all sorts of ridiculous things about me if, they, if they're so motivated. Uh, and quite a few people have, have contacted me on Twitter or email. I'm always happy to, to chat to anybody who's questions or is interested. No, no, that's that's wonderful, and you know, I just, you know, I can't say enough good things uh, about the book, and it was, it was, you know, absolutely lovely to 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 talk with you. It's it such a, such a good time. I really enjoyed the conversation. It, it was everything I wanted it to be, and more. And so, I can't say enough thanks for for having you come on and and uh, talk about your your wonderful work and, and research. I, I really do appreciate it. Thank you very much indeed for for, for the chat. I really enjoyed. Yeah, of course.